uh, some green yield, some soil moisture, some leaf temperature data that we've collected. Uh, and we're gonna present some of the data between 2019 and 2021. And the uh, excess and deficit water stress is just a fancy way of saying uh, during droughts and floods, all right? So when we've had wet years and dry years. So we came uh, upon this project a number of years ago. Uh, it was part of a much bigger regional project uh, across the upper Midwest uh, and included states like Michigan, Indiana, Ohio, uh, Missouri, Iowa, South Dakota, North Dakota. And what we were really interested in is looking at the response of uh, grain yield water, water content in the soil, crop canopy temperature to supplemental irrigation. And Supplemental irrigation in particular, not on the coarse texture soils, but on the fine texture soils like we have right around here. Uh, and uh, to see whether or not we could uh, make a difference in, in crop yields. So when we start looking at uh, sort of the, uh, the reason that we started working on this, between 1989 and 2018, I grabbed this data uh, from the Risk Management Agency. And they, they listed the two main causes of, of yield losses or crop losses and, and insurance payouts were related to drought and excess moisture. This is data obviously from Iowa, Minnesota, and Wisconsin. Uh, you can see there's quite a bit of variability uh, between the states over time, especially for the, for the drought, uh, where Iowa seems to have a lot more drought uh, payments than, than the other two states. But at the end of the day, when you tally all these up uh, for both excess moisture and for drought, the, the insurance payouts are in excess of about $6 billion. So it's not inconsequential money. Uh, it's, it's a lot of money that gets paid out for essentially natural disasters, if you will. The other thing is, is that when you total all these up, it's about 20,000 uh, different uh, payouts uh, caused by excess moisture and about only 16,000 because of drought. Now, when we want to kind of start thinking about that, I, I put this slide up because it's really trying to think about what's happened over the last 30 years and what's the trend uh, looking like for the future. So this is a graph uh, year on the bottom here, and this is the ratio of the total precipitation for summer over spring, okay? What, what you see up here is, is I've got two different sites, uh, Ames, Iowa, and Lamberton here. And of course, there's a lot of scatter in the data, but you see there's a, a negative trend. The slope's going down as you get further out in time, closer to present time. So what does that mean? Well, what that means is, is that over time, the trend suggests that when we look at the ratio of, of spring to summer rainfall, that summers are getting drier than the springs, okay? Um, and that's what climate change people who do all those big fancy models would predict as well. So our data here at Lamberton and the data down in Ames are showing pretty similar trends. Summers are getting drier, uh, springs are getting wetter. So that brings us to the field experiment uh, that we did here at Lamberton. Uh, we had three replications out on our drainage plots. So I'm just gonna be showing the results of the yields, the soil moistures and uh, um, the crop canopy temperature data this year or at, at this meeting, but we've also got subsurface drainage data that we've collected from these. So we can look at the volume of water that drained from the plots as well as the, as the quality of that water uh, under the, uh, the five years actually of data that we have. Um, so this is a Normania loam soil. We have every crop represented every year. So we've got corn and soybeans, uh, every year that we did this uh, represented by the green and the yellow uh, on that little diagram. And we had a randomized complete block design with three replications on this particular project. Our agronomics, we had 30 inch rows. Uh, we did cultivation after harvest. We did some additional uh, field cultivation before planting to kind of level everything out. 35,000 plants per acre for corn, 150 for soybeans. Um, and we were using just our, our normal fertilizer and weed control practices that we use here at the research center uh, to try to deal with that type of a thing. The water management is what was kind of the real key to this. Uh, so we had basically three different types of water management. 
So we had our rain fed, that was our control. So we weren't doing anything other than just letting mother nature take her course. Uh, we had a full irrigation, which was to meet evapotranspiration demand. And then we had a limited or deficit irrigation where we were putting on 50% of the amount that we would have for the full, right? And the, the data that I'll show here in a little bit will bear that out. We had some choices to be able to make in terms of what type of irrigation we were going to use. Um, back in the mid 1970s, my predecessor, Dr. Wally Nelson and Bern Eidman, who was in applied economics up uh, in the St. Paul campus, they had done a project here actually using sprinkler irrigation, which would have mimicked overhead irrigation. Um, and at the time, uh, they said it was really, really close to being profitable to irrigate back in the, in the mid 70s. So we kind of revisited that with a couple of little twists with some of the extra data we collected, but also looking at the type of irrigation that we were going to use. So we decided we didn't want to go with uh, overhead sprinkler irrigation, uh, mainly because it was less efficient. Um, we decided to go with an on-surface drip irrigation, uh, which for us as a bunch of researchers is a little bit of a hassle. It's probably not something that we would recommend that you go out and do. But these are our long-term drainage plots and we really wanted to minimize disturbance on them. So we did not want to go in and put a subsurface drip irrigation system in, which is probably what would be typical um, to do. Uh, we had a project that we worked with the corn growers up in Yellow Medicine County where there's a, a grower that used subsurface drip irrigation on some of his fields and, uh, and the system worked pretty well and coarse and fine texture soils up there actually. The other, the other thing that was uh, unique to our project is, is that we used drainage water recycling concept. So basically what we were doing was is the pond that exists out at the research center that you drive past when you come in on Highway 330 from the east uh, is our pond that collects subsurface and surface runoff water from our farm from, from at least the south 320 acres. So what we did was is we ran some power out there, we ran a pump and a platform out there and we basically used the drainage water that we had collected in that pond to re-irrigate back out onto those plots, right? So this drainage water recycling term that I have in quotes there, uh, that was part of our really, really big project that we had uh, across the upper Midwest. So there were a number of these sites put in place uh, and we were looking at trying to test that technology. Some of the measurements that we were doing out there, of course, grain and biomass yield. Uh, we'll focus on the grain yield today when I'm talking. Uh, we've got water content uh, down to a depth of about 40 inches, so just about a meter uh, at six different depth increments that uh, you'll be able to kind of tell where we were doing that in one of my slides a little later. Uh, we were using some uh, wireless infrared thermometers to capture the, the crop canopy temperatures. Uh, the crop canopy temperature is going to give us an indication of the amount of stress either from the dry conditions or from heat uh, that that crop is under. Uh, and then of course, we just have weather, our weather uh, conditions uh, from our weather station where we get the precipitation from here at the station. So just to give you a little bit of a quick sort of overlook of the summary of the conditions over the three years that we're presenting here. So we chose 2019, 2020, and 2021. Uh, of the data that we've collected. We can go back to 2017, uh, but this just makes it a little bit more efficient where we actually have a wet year, a normal year, and a dry year, right? So we're not trying to hide anything from the other, the other years, but this makes it easy to kind of try to look at three years worth of our data, okay? So the long-term mean here at the research center during the May to September time is about <laughs> almost 19 inches. So 2020, uh, we had 18 inches, pretty close to the average. 2021, of course, this last year, we were about five inches below. And uh, in 2022, uh, we were about four inches above, okay? So, or excuse me, 2019, we were about four inches above. So, uh, of course, even though you see the, those numbers, the variability within those particular years was, was pretty great too. So even though the 2019 and 2020 uh, were different in terms of a wet year and more of a normal year, July was pretty wet in both of those months. Um, uh, during those two years. But you can see that June and July uh, in 2021 were clearly uh, quite dry. Well, I have a question. Um, what's on my screen is like jumping all over the place. Oh, okay, it's just going crazy here. <laughs> 
We'll pause one more time here, everybody, so that people that are watching can. I hadn't looked at it and all of a sudden I looked at it and it was like, oh, it's a slide to hold. So hopefully what's being seen on my screen will be able to be seen by the people online now. So when we start looking at the continuation of some of the summary of conditions, uh, this is our supplemental irrigation amounts that we were putting on. So 2019, the full and the deficit is what the F and the D represent. We didn't put any on in 2019. Um, 2020, we did add some small amounts uh, to the corn and the soybeans, uh, but we don't have those recorded on here for some reason. Um, 2021, uh, the, the full had about 8.4 inches for corn. The deficit was 4.2. That'll be an important number to remember. Uh, so again, clearly we're trying to achieve half of what we were doing. Uh, with that deficit irrigation. And the soybeans, uh, just because of the timing of the irrigation on those, we put on six and about three. So the first thing I want you to look at here when we start looking at some of the grain yields is, is to look at the, the three-year means uh, over on the right side of the screen. So the rain fed overall was statistically smaller uh, than the full or the deficit. And when you look at the full of the deficit, there's really no difference in yield between those two, which tells us that we can get by with half of the amount of water and still achieve uh, a pretty high yield. Now we know that there's quite a bit of variability among the treatments. So that's what's the, the data from 2021, 2020 and 19 under this average column. So in 2019, when it was really, really wet, uh, we, we had uh, really quite good yields, but they were not statistically different. Right? So this is what uh, also reflects on the importance of having subsurface drainage in our soils, is that despite the fact that we had 22 inches uh, of moisture during that particular year, and it was a really, really wet year, the fact that we had subsurface drainage out there, uh, our crops performed really, really well and clearly didn't need any irrigation, right? Um, if <clears throat> we look at 2020, uh, there was that, that normal year, uh, deficit irrigation in this particular case uh, was the lowest uh, recorded uh, yields compared to the full at 221. Uh, and the deficit in the rain fed, there was really no difference uh, in 2020 based on a statistical analysis. When we look at the 2021 year, the, the drought year, uh, we're looking at 142 for the rain fed and 230, 225 for the other two. So we're talking over 80 bushel yield increase. Uh, by adding four inches or eight inches of water to those plots. Um, that's pretty significant. When we look at soybean yields, we're going to see a similar trend here for the three-year mean. The full and the deficit uh, were uh, almost, well, they were what, about 13 bushels more uh, compared to the rain fed over the three years. But again, when we look at the individual years, we'll look at 2021 first. Uh, we've got about a 30 bushel yield increase for the beans on those. Uh, for 2020, uh, there were some slight increases in yield compared to the rain fed, uh, but it was only for the full irrigation system. And then again, in, in 2019, uh, there was no statistically significant difference. And I would argue that these yields probably would have been smaller if we didn't have very good drainage out there in that system. So um, they, they weren't great, but uh, they were better than they probably would have been if we didn't have them drained. So this is just a, a little bit of a snapshot of the soil water content. There's a lot, a lot of data that we look at. Um, this was kind of the most simplified way to look at it, and it's still inadequate really to kind of grasp as to what's going on. Um, these are the annual uh, average uh, soil moistures for the deficit, the full, and the rain-fed systems. Um, and the things that I want to really kind of point out is, is if you look at the sort of the trend here, uh, in, in the deficit and in particular in the rain fed, 
uh, where we're limiting the amount of water either through irrigation or naturally, uh, that there is a, a trend, of course, where you know 2019 was the wet, uh, 2020 was the, the normal year, and 2021 was the dry year. When you start looking at some of the, the data up at the surface areas of the profiles, you start seeing some, some interesting differences um, in the amount of moisture uh, in the profile. So 2021, where we had deficit irrigation, and 2021, where we had full, of course, you see the top two depths of the soil profile were, were fairly wet. Uh, of course, they were less wet in, in 2021 here. Um, now, there's, there's quite a lot of water there, even though it was a dry year. And you might be asking yourself, well, how come that is when you compare it to 2020? And, and 2020 was actually a little bit wetter year. Keep in mind that the yields in 2021 were considerably less than they were in, in 2020. Uh, and that crop was not being very efficient in using that moisture. Um, in fact, it was trying to uh, sort of put the brakes on and I'll, I'll kind of emphasize that in the, in the crop stress soil or the crop canopy temperature data. So the idea here was is that the crop really, there was moisture there, but it was, was trying to keep itself cool and it wasn't really putting uh, effort into uh, yield or biomass on those, on those sets of plots. So <clears throat> this data, the green bars uh, show uh, the full irrigation, the blue are the deficit or the limited irrigation and the red is the rain fed. So these are the period of time in July. So this is July 1st to about the 15th. And the red bars here represent the crop canopy temperature uh, where we have the rain fed conditions. So there was no irrigation going on. So you can see uh, right before silking and tasseling that reproductive change over here for the corn that there was about four or five days where there was a, about a five degree centigrade or Celsius temperature increase, which is it was just quite, a, quite warm uh, compared to the two that were irrigated, which were really showing not a whole lot of stress here. But this was telling us that that crop was under stress. And these were some windy days, some pretty hot days. Um, then all of a sudden we, we got some rain and it got cloudy and overcast for several days. And you can see that response where the, uh, the change in the temperatures between the, the treatments were not very drastic out here. And then all of a sudden we got into some drier, warmer, sunnier conditions. And we saw that, that, that go back up in terms of the separation between the temperature of that crop canopy. So that told us that even though we had uh, a crop that was growing, we ended up having 142 bushels uh, of corn out there for the rain fed. Um, and that the soil moisture, there was quite a bit still available in that top part of the canopy. Um, it was not able to use a lot of that because the, the crop was not cooling itself very efficiently. Uh, and it was under a lot of stress because of that heat and the wind that we had in these two periods of time. Um, did you have a question? We were, so the question was, is that, that's a great question. What was the irrigation schedule? So basically what we were doing was we were scheduling on a weekly basis, okay? And with our irrigation system, it would take us, depending on the deficit, it would take us two to three days to add the amount of water that we needed to. So we would irrigate usually for two or three days during the week, and then there'd be four days where we didn't irrigate. So excellent question. So, <clears throat> This data here uh, is the area that uh, I feel a little less comfortable talking about, but uh, I found a, on one of our, our really useful tools here, the irrigation investment calculator. So this came from the Midwest Regional Climate Center. I've given the, uh, the website so that anybody who wants to play around with this can. Um, so the tool assumes that you use center pivot irrigation. Other systems are possible, like subsurface drip or on-surface drip. Um, and I would note that based on the numbers that I could find in the literature, um, it's about $600 an acre less for center pivot compared to a subsurface drip irrigation. So there's more cost involved in that subsurface drip irrigation. But because I was not really uh, feeling super, super comfortable running that model, I'm not a modeler, um, I decided to just leave it at center pivot irrigation. All right, so just for full disclosure, um, you can do a lot more with the model, but I'm sure I would have messed it up. So I just left it the way it was with most of the defaults in there. 
The model is, is, seems to work really well, but it is a little bit limited. Uh, when they developed this uh, in the mid 2000s, uh, they used precipitation data from 1980 to 2005. So it's a little bit limited. It doesn't have the more recent precipitation data. Um, the other cool thing about this particular uh, calculator, and if you go onto this website, um, they have a growing degree calculator. They have this irrigation calculator. They have a lot of really cool calculators that are on that website. Uh, and they are at a county level basis. So this is actually the, the model that I'm gonna show that I ran uh, with the inputs and the outputs was for Redwood County conditions with the soils and the precipitation that we have here. Um, so, so that's kind of a neat thing. So just from a, from a standpoint of what, uh, I made some adjustments on some of the inputs here. Um, I had it scheduled for the year being purchased of 2022 that this system would be $225,000. Again, it was a center pivot. So we had 164 acres that it would cover for the system. Uh, the lifespan was 20 to 25 years, so I picked 25. Uh, there was a loan of about $200,000 at 4% interest, uh, and the loan term was eight years. So a lot of these are drop down little boxes that you can adjust uh, and, and you know, fit, uh, fit your system however you want in terms of paying for it and changing your, your uh, uh, borrowed rates. Uh, there's also uh, labor <coughs> questions. So the labor for the irrigation and family labor, we had about 10 bucks an hour. Uh, the cost for energy for the uh, water uh, system was about four bucks. Um, and then the, the yield goals, we had to put in 256 for the ones that I chose for those. I set the system up to be 50% corn and 50% soybeans in the outputs. Uh, you could put these at zero and 100 for whichever system you wanted. When I ran this, I think it was back on January 18th, uh, price for beans was $13.55 and $5 for corn. So those were the numbers that I ran for back then. The, the data over here for the, for the crop yields is really, really key, of course, in terms of how the model runs and what the outputs end up being. So the irrigated crop rotation yields, those data come directly from our study. Uh, and is why I was showing a wet year, a dry year, and a normal year. Okay, so these data come from the average maximums that we had uh, for those different systems that we had out there uh, for, the, the, for the, the rain fed, the dry, and the wet year. The dry land crop rotation data, so these yields for corn and soybeans, those come from the Redwood County averages. So I went into the National Ag Statistics database, and I instead of just using our data here at the center, I pulled out the, the average county yields for corn and beans um, for those uh, three years, 19, 20, and 21. And then I, I put those in as to the inputs into the model so that they would run that way. So here's the, uh, the outputs. So corn's on the left and soybeans are on the right. So just to kind of orient you here, these blue bars represent the percent of years that were either dry, average, or wet. So the average years are the majority of the years is somewhere over 60% of the years or more typical average type of years. Um, and so the blue bars are the same on each side. The wet years, this accounted for about 12% of the years. So 12% of the years between that 1980 and uh, 2005 uh, date of the data that they have, um, there were about 12% of those would have been wet years about 19%, if I remember, 19 or 20% were dry years. Um, so the, that's what these represent, and they're the same on those graphs. The solid line represents uh, the, the dry land yields um, that you would have out there. So uh, if you had a dry year uh, without irrigation, uh, your yield would be you know, somewhere down around, is that 180 bushels? Uh, just above 180 in the wet years. And again, uh, you, you do see uh, a bit of a slippage here uh, in the dry years. The wet years are, are not necessarily great, but because we have a subsurface drainage system out there, um, we do pretty well. On the average years, you're up around that 200, right? This dashed line represents what the potential is when you would go out and irrigate. So of course, the biggest gains are in those dry years. There are some gains here uh, in the normal years. And it suggests that there are some small gains in the 
the wet years depending on the, the timing of that rainfall. Soybeans is a completely different uh, animal. Uh, you see a similar trend uh, with the, uh, the slopes or the, the positioning of the, the dry land yields, although uh, during the dry years, uh, the soybeans suffer a bit more uh, than, than they do in the wet years, again, probably because of the drainage system. Um, so you see a really big uh, benefit to the irrigation during the dry years, a little bit during the wet years, and then basically none uh, during those, uh, those wetter years. And that reflects back on some of the data that we input into the model. So at the end of the day, uh, when we look at this, uh, the, one of the uh, resulting outputs was the gross margins. Uh, and so this, the graph represents corn soybeans or a 50-50 mix uh, on a per acre basis uh, of what the gross margins would be. And then if you looked at the whole 164 acres, it was about $77,500 for the dry land. Under irrigation, where the same uh, area it was what about ninety two thousand six hundred, uh, and you can see that there were some some increases uh, in those margins uh, for each one of those cropping systems. There, the second to last slide that I've got here. Uh, so based on the inputs that I used that were defaults in the model, and then the data that I put in based on our own study, said that the the net present value would be positive, uh, but of course, you know, this was for a center pivot system, not a, not a on surface or sub surface drip. And the amount was about $16,000. Now, when the model looks at that 1980 to 2012 period of time, uh, and it's trying to say, okay, how many years out of 26 uh, are gonna be uh, profitable? Um, according to the way the model ran, it was 23 years would be profitable and three years would not be profitable, according to the model. Okay, As I said, stated up front, I'm not a modeler. I did what I could with this. I know that there's more complex things that I could have probably tried to do with it in terms of adjusting fertilizer rates and things like that, but I decided I just didn't know enough about how that model worked, so I decided not to do that. So just a summary and conclusions here, the, the water content varied uh, in the soil based on precipitation, which is pretty obvious. The canopy temperature, uh, the rain fed was the highest, so it was under the most stress compared to the deficit or the full irrigation, especially under that 2021 data that I showed you. Um, we saw statistically significant differences between the rain fed and the uh, deficit and the um, full irrigation. Uh, but when we look at those three-year averages, it suggests that you can get by if you use uh, supplemental irrigation, uh, you could get by with uh, a deficit system and use half the water and, and uh, half the costs really. Uh, on these fine texture soils, uh, at least at this present day and age, uh, when we ran the model and we collected all of the data, uh, it shows that uh, under moderately drought, under moderate drought conditions, we can, uh, reduce stresses and actually um, make a little bit of money uh, by doing it compared to what Wally fell back in the 70s. It's gonna be important to be thinking somewhat about this um, as we move into the future. I think uh, you know if, if climate projections are what they claim they are and those trends continue to go down and we get dry conditions in the summer, um, you know, our crops do pretty well without having that water out there, but uh, well, competitive advantage might say, you know, in some portion of the land, maybe we're going to have to put some water out there that we can uh, irrigate some systems. So that's all I have. And I know with all of our technical difficulties, Molly, well, I probably went way over. So not too bad. Any questions? Kind of yeah, so the, so the question is, is what sort of drainage is under the systems? So these systems are, are uh, mimicking uh, about a 90 foot drain spacing and they're buried at, at about four feet deep. Uh, and these have been in since the 1970s. So, so this research was actually done on our drainage plots. Um, so we were able to actually uh, you know, run this uh, on top of our drainage plots. The other thing that is, is kind of a key that I didn't mention and what really would have confounded the results that I showed today is the 17 and 18 data. Uh, what we did was is on top of the irrigation treatments, we actually layered uh, six different nitrogen rates 
because we also made an assumption that uh, we aren't going to be able to fertilize at the same rates uh, if we're irrigating uh, as if we weren't irrigating. So we actually went from zero to 240 pounds of N on those plots. Unfortunately, uh, 17 and 18 were also kind of borderline wet, um, or 16 and 17 were kind of borderline wet. Um, so it was 18. Um, so we, we had one year that uh, 2017 that showed a statistically significant increase in yields um, and because of water and because of nitrogen. Uh, so that data showed us that at least in the 2017 data that of course, it, it makes sense that, you know, if we're irrigating, we're gonna need a little bit more nitrogen out there uh, to satisfy the crop needs. So, but I didn't wanna confound this analysis with that. Well, if you don't have any other questions, that's fine. I'll be around all day. So um, I will, uh, do you have any in the chat? No, okay. Sounds good. Do I have to stop and share? Or do you want to Overhead projectors, they're the answer. <laughs> Do you want to go back to that? Yeah. Remember George Ream scribbling all over the darn things? Well, while Molly's getting this up, I can maybe try to keep us a little bit on schedule. Um, oh, she's done. Um, so the title is this, uh, When to Surrender to Corn Rootworms and Other Deep Thoughts. And I was putting this together and I um, had a couple of topics I wanted to discuss. Couple topics I wanted to discuss, and uh, it's not moving here. Why is this not? Please stand by. What are you I'm trying to advance this way? One thing I'm gonna tell you is that in your handouts, uh, I've got more slides here than in your handouts. Those are for tables and stuff that might be hard to, hard to read. Um, but we might as well get, try to get started here. I uh, wanted to talk about several topics here, but we're gonna be short on time. I was driving over here with Lee Kloster from New Ulm this morning and he's responsible for bringing the donuts. But anyhow, uh, which is really important, but anyhow, uh, I was mentioning to Lee that I just got too much stuff here and I can't get it all done. And Lee said, why don't you do just do a bunch of shallow thoughts instead of the deep ones? And that's what you're going to get. Um, one of the things I want to talk about a little bit real briefly is soybean aphids. We haven't had the problems we have normally had with those for the past few years. There's some reasons for it. And the other reason I want to bring those up is because of uh, some issues with uh, lost uh, chlorpyrifos as an option. I'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, I'm going to talk, spend most of my time on rootworms. Um, so we've got some problems, particularly for guys that grow continuous corn, and it's not uh, it's not a good situation. And finally, if we have some time, uh, I'll talk a little bit about soybean gall midge, just where it's at, and maybe why Minnesota doesn't have the problems uh, that Nebraska does. But if I don't get to that. There is a two-part webinar series coming up the 15th and the 22nd of February. 
And it's all the researchers that uh, work with Gall Midge in the upper Midwest. And it'll be a pretty detailed uh, look at that insect. And if you got questions on anything else, uh, I don't have time for religion and politics, but anything else best related we can probably deal with. All right, so where have all the aphids gone? They're not extinct. One of the things that's happened is weather. And we've had some cold snaps, particularly north of here, where it's got below 25, 35 degrees below zero. In the past couple of years, that's knocked those populations back. Those are the temperatures that the eggs on buckthorn are gonna freeze. And one of the things we have to remember about soybean aphids is they move around during the summer. And if we lose big chunks of, of aphid production, that means less aphids moving into the southern part of the state um, during the year. So overall state populations are down. Um, they don't like it real hot. And in fact, when we get this hot weather like we had in 2021, we switch to uh, spider mites as a pest. And the spider mites are gonna actually help compete soybean aphids. Uh, rainfall, a lot of rainfall, we get fungal diseases going on. They don't do well on soybeans that have surplus moisture. Uh, wind, this year, when those aphids were moving off of buckthorn, remember how hot and windy it was when those beans were small? Okay, real tough conditions for those aphids to colonize soybeans. We're seeing a lot of predation and parasitism now. I'll show you a slide in a minute. Um, is aphid behavior changing? Possibly. We're seeing less aphids on buckthorn in the fall than we have in the past, so something's different. Uh, there's definitely a change in soybean genetics, and you guys probably have all recognized the issue with preethroid resistance, okay? Soybean aphids are, you know, um, used to use a lot of preethroids as far as uh, controlling aphids, and that option has kind of gone for us. And maybe other things have changed as well. Uh, lab work, Bob Cook's lab, looks like there's no fitness cost for those preethroid resistant aphids. In other words, they do just as well or better than the susceptible ones, but maybe something else has changed in behavior uh, along with that. This is just a reminder of all the things that are out there helping control aphids uh, and spider mites as well. A lot of beneficial insects. In the case of aphids and spider mites, cool, wet conditions, fungal diseases are as good as any insecticide. The only problem is they don't really take hold until those populations get very hot, very high. Uh, and we're seeing a lot of, a uh, lot more uh, aphid, uh, parasitic wasps in the system now. Especially this little black guy, these black mummies, Aphelina certus, um, and that may be helping knock those populations down. All right, don't try to read all this, but at one time, we had a lot of options to control soybean. Uh, the carbamates and organophosphates, chlorpyrifos or warsban was one of those. The perethroids, things like warrior were in that group. The neonicotinoids, um, by themselves, they don't work very well foliar, but they're used in a lot of mixes. And some newer relatives of neonics, uh, transforms in, uh, in Savanto. And another group uh, is uh, Safina, okay? We were in good shape. One thing I'm gonna to mention too is just because something's labeled for soybean aphid or for a uh, particular insect, doesn't mean these compounds all work equally well, right? That's all I'm gonna really say about that because otherwise I'll say something somebody disagrees with, with and they won't let me on Spotify anymore or something like that. Okay. All right, so when we lost uh, the preethroids, we lost quite a chunk, okay? We can still get some of the mixes, and we're still getting efficacy, things that are mixed with chlorpyrifos, for example. But now that we've lost chlorpyrifos, our options are really limited. This group down here works pretty good, actually very well. But the thing that we're going to miss without chlorpyrifos is, especially with aerial application, um, you're going to have to really pay attention um, to your application technology. We're not getting that low vapor pressure and movement around the canopy like we did with, with the chlorpyrifos. Okay. I've got another table in your uh, handouts. Um, spider mites also was a good product, but we got a lot of benefit from chlorpyrifos. 
And this table shows you what's labeled for corn and soybeans. It also shows you what stages are controlled by that particular pesticide. Some of those don't control uh, eggs. And Lorsban was a good example of that. Dimethoate's another one. You knock out the adults and immatures, but it doesn't do anything for eggs and the residual short. And if you've got a big infestation, a lot of eggs out there, they'll hatch in a few days and the infestation starts all over again. Um, okay. Chlorpyrifos used to be on this list and it's not anymore. We did some work this summer, unfortunately, put a lot of uh, pesticides out, but unfortunately, uh, we had enough dews and cool weather and a big population that we actually killed all killed the trial with the fungus instead of uh, letting it run. We didn't get it run all the way to uh, past a week after uh, uh, application. But dimethoate still works; it's still labeled. Um, and then you've got some other comp compounds. Zeal that's not going to work on an established infestation. Okay, it's more it's more for uh, vegetables and stuff where they're putting it on in advance. All right. Now we're gonna talk about our problem. We've got a couple of species of rootworms out there just as review, westerns and northerns are the other species. I'll have that in a minute. Uh, we knocked those populations back with cold weather during the winter of 2013, 14, and they've been building ever since. These are more of a problem in continuous corn. Um, we haven't documented um, res, uh, variant in Minnesota that lays eggs and soybeans like they have in the Eastern Corn Belt. And we haven't documented extended diapause. I've got question marks there because of some of the stuff we saw this summer. We'll talk about that. A um, lot more issues with resistance to BT. Um, Basically, the CRY3 proteins, there's cross resistance to, the, to them. This is, would be the old yield guard. Uh, these are some of the syngenitrate, Zagreshire, rootworm, and then the combination is Duracade. There's cross resistance to these, and that resistance to that CRY3 protein is pretty fixed in the Western corn rootworm population. There's a lot of it out there, and we're seeing more resistance to the 34, 35, or the Herculex rootworm trait. And we're seeing problems with pyramids, okay? Um, there is a new technology coming out, the RNAi stuff. The first one's gonna be AgriSure Pro. And we'll talk about that in a minute. It's a tool, but don't count on it to save you. Northerns, they're increasing as well. They haven't caught up to, to uh, Westerns yet. They're found in both continuous and, and rotated corn. That rotated corn is because of that extended diapause trait. They're a lot more mobile. They'll move back and forth between fields during the summer. They'll go out and look for pollen. The eggs are a lot more cold tolerant than Western corn rootworm eggs. And now we've got resistance in Northern populations in some fields in North Dakota and Minnesota and it's multiple traits. The bad news is at least in Ken Osley's work in Minnesota, um, north of here, looks like if you've got resistant, BT resistant northerns, it doesn't get rid of the uh, extended diapause trait. So you can have both going on at the same time. And that makes things really, really quite difficult. All right. So you got a field and you got lots of beetles and you can't rotate fields out of corn. You might have a reason for it. it might be just because you're not trying hard enough, uh, but you might have an ethanol contract. You might have a problem with uh, enough uh, corn to feed, feed a livestock operation. So what do you do? Uh, you could try BT and a full rate of a good insecticide, a consistent insecticide, okay? If you've been planning conventional corn, um, there's a chance the traits might work. You could get into the beetle bombing mode. That's a tough thing to do. It's weekly scouting. You got to wait till about 10% of the females are gravid and take them out. If you wait too long, you've got too much egg lay 
and that emergence happens over a long period of time. So you can't just spray it once. You'll probably end up spraying twice. And if you're as lucky as I am, you'll probably be out there three times. And it's going to be tassel corn, probably an aerial application. So the cost goes up. So what if you've got a problem where you've got a pyramid? You've got a BT pyramid out there and you've got problems. If you're looking at those roots and they're chewed up and you got a lot of beetles, what do you do? Well, first thing is, if, it's, if you've got more than a half a node gone, those are supposed to be reported and you can't plant the same traits back in that field. Remember the cross resistance? Okay, so if you had, if you've got, uh, uh, um, say, a, a, a chrome or a smart stack, you've already got the Herculex trait in there. And if you've got um, chrome, you've got the Duracade trait in there. And if it's smart stacks, you got the 3BB1 trait in there. Okay. The only way you can switch is if you've got a problem with the Syngenotype hybrids, then maybe you can go to a smart stack. Otherwise, you need to go back to conventional corn and an insecticide. Okay. I'm just a little ray of sunshine, aren't I? It's worse. All right. So not only is, are bad things happening in your field, if, if you're in that situation, but these beetle, Western beetles move back and forth. Okay. We're talking mostly about Westerns now. If you rotate that field out of corn for a year, you can reset the clock in that field, okay? You can help the injury the next time you put corn in. You will lessen the injury because you'll starve all those beetles out, but you're not going to do anything to resistance. And those beetles that are moving out of your field elsewhere, if it's a BT field that you're having a problem with or a pyramid field, they're carrying the resistance with them. So you get these little areas that are real hot, real high beetle populations. They tend to be those areas that have a lot of livestock and a lot of continuous corn, okay? And the populations and the resistance is pretty fierce in those type of situations, All right? So I'm gonna give you a little bit of good news for a minute or two. You know, Western corn rootworms don't like it very cold. And the eggs right now are in the soil. Most of them are in less than four inches okay, in the soil. Um, they're exposed to some temperatures. Once you start getting below 20 degrees, you can start to have some egg mortality. And then it's a matter of how cold it is and how long. So there's some lab studies they did a, a few years back and in if you have them at 14 degrees for a week, they'll kill maybe about 50% of those eggs. Two weeks, that mortality goes up. Four weeks, you'll kill them all, okay? That's pretty cold. Those are pretty cold temperatures, especially four inches deep in the soil. And if you get that uh, temperature down to a half a degree Fahrenheit, they'll die. I mean, that's, that's uh, the super cooling point and they'll die right there. The northern, uh, the Northerns are a lot more tolerant, okay? Obviously, because they're Northerns, right? Um, at that same half a degree Fahrenheit, you're gonna be maybe 50 to 50 or a bit more mortality compared to completely complete mortality. And even if you get down to uh, seven below zero in that soil, you're still gonna have, have some survivors. So what's it look like? This year. What I've got is a graph of soil temperatures at the four inch depth at, at Lamberton here. This is a new uh, weather system we've got. And the black bar is the daily average. We've got the high soil temp and the low soil temp. And here's our part where it's point where we start to get mortality. Here's that 14 degree I talked about. We've dipped down there a little bit, but not very long. Okay, and once you get down in here for Westerns, they're dead, okay, or they should be dead. If they're behaving like they do in the lab. That doesn't always happen. Uh, so at this point, we've done something to them. We haven't wiped the Western populations out. My hope is we've knocked this disaster back from biblical to maybe just epic. And if it keeps cold, 
um, if it keeps cold, uh, we might be in better shape. The only other thing that we can hope for in weather is that if we have uh, flooded soils in early June, when those eggs are hatching before the larvae get into the roots. But everybody wants flooded soils in early June, right? Okay. Uh, Minnesota Corn uh, has uh, funded uh, this project for a few years, and we're finally getting some to the point where we can get some useful data out of this. Uh, and what we've got is people are cooperating with uh, sticky, uh, yellow sticky traps for rootworm beetles. And what we have is the uh, maximum number of beetles per day in, at each site. Uh, the green is two or less. Yellow is three to four, red is four. Uh, some companies are, uh, people are using two as kind of a guideline for problems. That's pretty conservative. Um, I like to use four based on some old data. And uh, there's probably a pretty good indication that there's a problem there. We had, this is 233 traps. We threw some out because uh, uh, they weren't in, they were incomplete. We didn't know if they were BT or not, but if you're interested in participating next year, let me know and we can get you some traps. All right, what can we say from these traps? All right. We can tell you what the risk for future injury is in that field. We can tell you the same thing if you're counting, looking at beetles out there. We can tell you if you've got resistance in that field, if you're developing resistant beetles, but you have to be looking at the roots. And the reason for that is you have to know if those beetles are coming out of that field or moving into that field, into the traps from the surrounding areas, okay? We can maybe get an idea of what's driving beetle populations locally. Is it planting date? Is it uh, weather? That sort of thing. And maybe relative um, risk by geography. So we can see on that on these maps maybe some areas that have high concentrations of livestock, that sort of thing. Can't tell you about a damn thing about the field next door. These populations are so field specific that you really have to be looking at each field individually. Even as far as resistance, all these resistant field, BT resistant fields, they're not all the same. Some are resistant to uh, just three, cry three, some a little bit to Herculex, some to everything, okay? Um, one of the things we can show, and this is an unexpected, but uh, um, if you've got first year corn, and part of that's due to extended diapause, we see some Northern populations that are fairly high, and that's kind of a new event after the last couple of years. Here's the problem, here's Westerns. This is first year corn. Now I could blow this all off and say it's because beetles are moving into this field. It's an attractive field for the beetles. The problem is some of these, one of these fields was down where we were doing gall midge research and we had cages, emergence cages in first year corn. We were getting Northerns and Western beetles emerging out of that first year corn. So if something's wrong, don't know if we've got a, a diapause variant, don't know if we've got rootworms laying eggs and soybeans or something else, but it's something that we really have to figure out because if we've got Westerns laying eggs and we've got Western problems in first year corn, now this whole dynamic changes. It used to be, you know, these big Western problems, that was when you had three, four or five years of corn, okay? Not first year corn. This is BT, and uh, northern populations, we're starting to see some, some high populations here. We don't know if it's, if it's resistance or they're moving into the field. And if you look at westerns, it's not hard to find resistant populations. The point I just mentioned about being field specific, notice all the no, no populations and low populations of Westerns mixed in with the high ones. Okay. You gotta be looking at each field individually. Here's kind of a summary. These are BT fields and no BT fields. If we look at uh, number of years in corn, one, two, or three or more, 
And if we look at the Western beetle populations, this is the highest trap week for that an individual for individual sites, and then it's the it's the uh, maximum. Uh, so we're looking at the maximum number of beetles per trap per day, and these are average across all these sites. Not many here. Starting to see a few, and we're starting to see damage in southwest Minnesota that corner in first year or second year corn. That's a lot of beetles. Here's a problem. Here's no BT. Here's BT. There's not much difference between the two, is there? For westerns, that's resistance to BT. Okay. Here's what I'm worried about. Guys are going to embrace this new technology, the mRNAi stuff, and they're going to put it in their worst fields because it's going to save them, right? That RNAi protein or technology needs a working BT underneath it. Those aren't working. And you're going to see some unexpected damage right away. It's going to aggravate your seed dealer. Well, maybe not. Um, but the other problem is you're pushing that resistance to the RNAi right away. <clears throat> we look at northerns, those populations are overall lower. And you can see that there's a bigger difference between the BT and the non-BT, non-BT corners. What are we doing for time? Five minutes? All right, um, I'm just gonna go through pesticides briefly, insecticides briefly. Um, I mentioned, we'll talk about using them as a control technique. Seed treatments, if you're gonna use them, you gotta use the highest rate. And they're not enough if you actually got a bad problem. Liquids. Some of the liquids are really good. Some of them are not good at all. And they're, even the good ones are less consistent than the granules. This year, liquids didn't work well at all because it was dry. And we had some problems with some of the granules as well. If they were uh, just a straight pyrethroid because they're not very soluble. Okay. Granulars are the most consistent. You got some options here. And then the issue is, do you have the equipment on your planter to use them? If you had a rootworm problem, that's what I would try to use. Okay. And there's a couple liquids that, that, that are going to be uh, better, but um, not as consistent. So this is, since we started to get uh, resistant rootworms in 2012 in southern southwest Minnesota, so this is Lamberton results, Springfield results, high pressure, one and a quarter to two nodes gone, big western uh, rootworm populations, and cry three resistance, and now we're starting to see more and more evidence of uh, cry 34 or 35. These rootworm studies, at least the last two years, are still on the Research and Outreach Center site. So you can look at liquids, you can look at the granules, you can look at granules on traits, that sort of thing. Um, if we look at, on all these studies, uh, studies we had, if we look at BT, we're getting a half to two nodes, and we're getting uh, 24 to 75% control, remember. These are resistant populations, so we're not getting that 100%. Granulars up to 1.7 nodes, and, they're, and we're getting a benefit 34 to 99% of the time. So in, in some of these studies, layering on a BT is helping. Liquids, up to 1.3 nodes. But like I said, some of them don't work, so we're looking at zero to 98%. And the seed applied, even the high rate. Not very good. Some of these populations are really bad for resistance and, and these traits aren't gonna work as well as, as this even. So we're looking at corn uh, rootworm input management, use beetle scouting or, or sticky traps to determine the risk in a field. Look at root injury and beetle populations to determine where you're at for your management success and look at and resistance. If, um, 
You're going to get a return investment for a trait or an insecticide when the rootworm populations are high. But again, you're not going to get the return if you're just doing a blanket to treat every field the same. And the point is, you really got to remember is root injury is more significant. Um, and, and the insecticides perform less well when there's drought stress. I would add an insecticide layer if you've got high rootworm pressure. If you're in an area that might have some resistance or you suspect something might be happening. But remember, if you've got these real high populations, even a BT with an insecticide might not give you enough control, okay? Go back to that first slide I have where you've got a lot of beetles being produced, especially if you've got BT. Um, you don't have to surrender, but the longer you push that issue and the more you're trying to, to fudge your way through it, the worse it's going to get, the worse it's going to get for the other, your other fields and your neighbor's field. Um, you might want to consider a tactical withdrawal, okay? Reset the clock a little bit. Just going to mention gall midge uh, briefly. Um, this is, you can go to the soybean gall midge website. They keep track of distribution. We've added a bunch of new counties in Minnesota. This map looks like it's expanding its range. Uh, the first county we knew of in Minnesota was down here in Rock in 2019 he had, or 18. He had problems before that. Um, but really, this instead of range expansion, it might just be we're getting out to more fields and getting better at finding these real low infestation levels. This part of Nebraska, uh, the problem is a lot worse and into this very southern corner of, uh, of South Dakota. Minnesota, we've only got a field, few fields that are uh, that I would call economic, at least that I know of. The rest of them are fairly low at this point. And here's uh, that gall midge webinar. We're going to talk about that um, in the gall midge website. I'm going to just skip to this last slide here. We don't know if this insect's native or introduced. One of the things we're uh, soybean funding has helped is starting to help look at is we're looking at other annual legume crops, things like dry beans, azuki beans, lava beans, that sort of thing. And we're putting these in, in fields um, that we know are infested when the adults are out. Uh, we're putting them in these, growing them in these pots, putting them out in the field bringing them back, letting them incubate for a while, then dissecting them. The only ones we're seeing with infested so far is soybean. We know we can find them on sweet clover, once in a while on alfalfa, but soybean <laughs> seems to be a lot more, uh, a lot more effective, or affected rather. And one of the reasons is when we're looking at these seedlings in the, in the greenhouse and in the field, soybeans have a real strong tendency to split that outer stem layer while they grow. And these other things like dry beans don't seem to do that. They grow a stem and it's a thick size and that's it. Soybean stems keep expanding through the growing season. So we're gonna keep going on this and we're gonna do some, we're still looking at uh, some native plants trying to figure out, um, help us figure out if this thing's native or what it all, what it all infests. I'm gonna stop right there. And if you got any questions, I'd be happy to answer, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Where they're laying eggs? You mean you're talking rootworms now, right? right. Okay. Um, possibly. Um, I guess, I guess the, the, quest, the question is can you use like a curcubit or you could use sweet corn or a late planted corn or something like that too to, to draw those beetles in to certain areas to lay eggs? That's a possibility. But if a field's already infested, and this is more of a corn on corn situation, um, with the adults come out, 
they're going to their, their mating on the way out takes about 10 days or so for those eggs to, to develop and they'll start laying eggs but they're going to lay them right close by these westerns don't they, we sometimes they don't even move from 30 foot plot to 30 foot plot here they're pretty local and when they do move it's 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 because they're crowded westerns anyhow it's crowded and they're tending to move long distances so it would work but you'd probably be pulling foreign beetles in instead one of the things we're probably going to have to start doing is putting some traps out in soybeans to see if there's something moving through there we're in these soybean fields all the time down in Rock County, and and we they're very we see very few, and they're they're usually all almost always in the corn. So we got to figure out what's going on. So, but that's a good question. Anything else? Well, thanks. The other speakers are going to be a lot more optimistic. So I'll be around uh, for the rest of the day too. So thanks. Next speaker is going to be uh, Dr. Axel Garcia. He's going to talk about uh, planting green and cover crops. And I read the first part of his title and it said planting green, and I wasn't sure if he was going to bury John Deere equipment out there or what was going on. So, anyhow. Thanks for the Well, one thing I forgot to mention, folks, is that this uh, these VPs are getting more and more complicated. You guys hear me there, Buck? Perfect. Well, good morning, everybody. Thanks, so, thanks for coming. And uh, yeah, I'm going to be talking about cover crops and uh, and something that has been, you know, going around, which is the possibility of planting green. So this is just uh, some ideas about it, and we have already conducted some uh, trials here at the center, and uh, we would like to show you what is going on. Uh, I will try to use this laser. I borrow from, from, from Jeff's truck, but I believe if I do it, uh, those who are online will not be able to, to see it. So I will also try to, to use the, the mouse if I can. It looks like I cannot, so okay. Sounds good. Okay, and also I would like to thank my uh, co-author in this presentation, which is Liz Starr from University of Minnesota Extension. We've been doing some work together here at the Extension. So. This is what I am planning to talk to you today. Uh, quickly, why cover crops in corn soybean, uh, some cover crop challenges in Minnesota, and then what we have seen in terms of uh, seeding date uh, for cover crops, and that takes us into why eventually we could uh, try to use uh, planting uh, green for corn and soybeans, some results and some final remarks. So the first thing is why cover crops uh, in corn and soybeans. So to me, it's very simple. Uh, uh, it's not as simple as that. We have some other technical issues. But basically, uh, corn and soybeans, as you guys know, are the most important crop in the state. So we basically use around 
percent of our of our agricultural land. So that's a lot. So and that it would make sense to try to see if we can put a little bit of corn, uh, a little bit of uh, corn crops into that rotation. The issue is that uh, we usually plant corn so it is early and we harvest both crops a little late. Is that what happens? Thanks. So uh, if we were able to overcome those problems, that would be really great for cover crops. Um, so now it's not moving forward. <laughs> Let's see. Like this, like this, like this. Sorry, guys. One more problem here. And the thing is, uh, if we want to put cover crops into the corn and soybeans, we should try to have those cover crops usually seeded as early as possible during the, uh, at the end of the growing season and have those cover crops as much as possible <coughs> on the ground in the, in the next spring. So how can we do that without reducing the uh, productivity of corn and soybeans? That's, that's the main thing. And obviously, the way we do it, which is, let's say, planting cover crops at the end of the season and then terminating at least a couple of weeks before we go ahead and plant corn and soybeans. Uh, honestly, guys, we will probably be just wasting our money and our time because we are not going to produce too much biomass from the cover crops. The bottom line here is that the more biomass we produce, from the cover crops, the better it's going to be for whatever uh, people is talking about sustainability and those kind of things. So, and that's, those are the things I wanted to show you here. So, but the main issue we have in the state is our weather or our climate, generally speaking. So we have really a very, very, very short window opportunity for our cover crops to grow. And, uh, and it's basically very difficult. This is a typical, uh, growing season for corn and soybeans, uh, as you can see here. Uh, this is for 2020 here at the station. And you can see we can, we can have cover crops planted at the end of the season. And by the time frost comes, so those cover crops have grown basically not much, almost nothing. Okay. So we can do whatever research we want to try to determine what is the benefit of these cover crops at this point in terms of production of biomass, covering the ground and reducing the uh, leaching of nitrogen or whatever you want, and it's minimum. It's not that there is nothing, but it's minimum. And I would like you to, I, I wanna make sure that I am talking about cover crops following corn and soybeans here, okay? But also, if we have cover crops that are winter killed, we are done here, that's it. There is no more cover crops for next year, but we can have uh, cover crops that over winter. So stop growing here, and then it will continue growing in the next, next season, and eventually it has to be terminated. And it has to be terminated somewhere here, probably. So we have two weeks, and then we plant corn and soybeans again, or we we keep growing the, the crop until here, but then it's gonna it's gonna be a little bit late for us to plant corn and soybeans. Uh, but also we can just uh, inner seed cover crops into corn at the beginning of the season. It will not grow too much. It will be under the corn canopy. And eventually when we harvest the corn, uh, this will take off and again, it's gonna grow just a little bit before we have the, uh, the frost come. So anyway, so we have done this uh, modeling study just to show you that if we plant cover crops very early, we can have more than 3,000 pounds per, per acre of uh, dry biomass. So that is great, but we have to plant in August the 1st. So it does not match uh, the corn and soybean uh, season. So, and so on. So the, the latest we plant the cover crops, the less biomass we produce. And this window I have here, I show you here, is the window when we usually uh, seed cover crops here uh, following corn and soybeans harvest. So you can see that our models tell us that we will be harvesting around 500 to 800 pounds of, uh, of biomass. And that's, that's probably our best uh, years. 
we had years where we were harvesting just uh, some 100 and 150 pounds. So again, as I said at the beginning, it's just uh, a lot of work for not too much in terms of the benefits we are going to get. So what can be done? Well, you can see here, so this is the seeding time. If we start to seed in somewhere in August, uh, then it stops growing here. And then we have to terminate here, right? And then we are gonna plant our corn and soybeans somewhere here. But this is for cereal rye, but you have different planting dates. Those are the different lines here. And uh, whatever you do, I mean, whenever you, you plant this cereal right here, it will stop growing during the winter time and then we resume growth in the spring. And if we go all the way to produce grain here, that is great, but that's gonna be by the end of July, like wheat, right? But for cover crop, we have to terminate somewhere here. But what if we let that cover crop to grow a little bit more? I am talking on a couple of more weeks. So in fact, we've seen very consistently that the first three weeks of May are basically the weeks when the cover crops grow around here. And when, when I say around here, I'm talking probably the upper Midwest, okay? So that is the window for the cover crops to really produce biomass and eventually provide us for what we are looking at, which is the environmental benefits, the agroecological benefits or whatever we wanna call it. If we don't have enough biomass, basically those cover crops are not doing too much, right? So this, this is, uh, what is planting green? Basically planting green refers to, you know, planting a uh, cash uh, planting uh, the cash crop into an actively growing uh, cover crop in this case instead of planting into terminated cover crops some 10 14 days uh, after its termination so if we do that so we will guarantee much more uh, cover crop biomes and as you can see in this small graph here so this is uh, the seeding dates for cover crops and these are the, the termination days. So we terminated here in, I don't see here very well. <laughs> Move here on, on May the 6th and then on May the 18th. So the difference between May the 6th and May the 18th is more than one third more biomass and sometimes uh, more, almost doubles that amount of biomass. And that is in two more weeks of growth, okay? But again, the problem there would be planting corn or soybeans around May 18th, which is kind of crazy. But we've seen some results that uh, makes us, us think that we could eventually uh, have that as um, one more option to, to have cover crops in the system and then uh, have a more sustainable uh, production of uh, corn and soybeans. So we conducted an experiment last year and I will talk a little bit more about this uh, a little bit later. Uh, this is May 18th. And what you see here is where we just planted corn. That's the planting green thing. So we are doing this here. So in July uh, the 4th, our corn uh, here looked like this. And I don't know if you guys can see how the control looked like. The control was the one that was terminated 10 to 14 days before. It looks much better there than here. And then later in August, our control looked like this. Well, remember that last year was extremely dry, okay? So basically during three months, the three months that our corn and soybeans grow, we didn't get basically any rainfall around. Here. And uh, this is our treatment with the, the planting green. And it's, look, it's looking a little bit greener under, you know, than the one that is the control. So, I mean, visually, the, the planting green looked better, but Again, that's, this was a dry year and was our first attempt to see whether or not this practice could work, okay? So it remains to be seen how it looks like in terms of uh, yield of corn. Anyway, so uh, these are results from previous uh, research. What basically what we did was we conducted experiments with uh, cover crops into corn and soybeans at different locations. This is Grand Rapids, Lumberton and uh, in Wasika, we have different seeding dates. We have uh, uh, corn plant, uh, 
cover crops planted uh, at the beginning of the season for corn. And the bottom line here is that we have no effect in corn productivity, okay? But this is again, our cover crops did not grow too much. And the fall biomass of the cover crops was very marginal to say, to say something. So the end season benefits were marginal as well, okay? And, and the message here is that uh, cover crops did not have enough time to, to grow. So we basically, we have to terminate them uh, very early. So we won't have the issues with uh, the establishment of our cash crop. So, uh, and in terms of yield, you can see, as I previously said, there is no effect or whatsoever during, in three locations during two years uh, with the use of, of cover crops that were seeded uh, and the, at the end of the season and terminated uh, 10 to 14 days before planting corn. So no problems with uh, the uh, performance of, of corn in this case. So, and you can see as well that uh, even though we, it only had some one, two, three, and four instances where uh, you know the reduction of uh, nitrogen nitrate at uh, more or less four feet deep was significant as compared to other treatments. Uh, we can also see that most of the time the concentration of nitrogen it not work anymore goes up you know, from a treatment with a cover crop to a treatment without cover crop. So the higher the concentration at four feet, it means that the potential for nitrogen losses is higher, is higher as well. So when we put cover crops, we can show that, uh, we can see that that concentration is reduced. So yes, cover crops work. The problem is that don't work as much as we would like to see that nitrogen losses being reduced. In this case, used by the cover crop, then cover crop when terminated, can return it back to the system. Not all, but probably most of it, okay? So we would like to see much more than that, but it's very complex because of our conditions. So let's see what we have here. So here, what we have is the, uh, the effect of early interseeded cover crops on corn productivity. So you see here, uh, we have annual ryegrass and crimson clover. What we did in this experiment, we have conducted this experiment for three, four years already. So what we did is we planted corn, and then uh, we have one control, which is the no cover. And then when we planted corn, we also planted uh, annual rye and crimson clover. And then we planted at V2, V4, V6, and uh, the same for crimson clover, okay? In the first year we did that, which was in 2019, basically uh, differences in yield were not that, uh, that much, okay? Uh, which surprised me. But here, I'm not showing to you, but here, I mean, we had enough rainfall, for example, that didn't affect too much the other treatments because even when we planted cover crops at the same time as corn, uh, reduction in yield was not as much. There was some very slight uh, differences. But if we move to the following year, look at if you plant cover crops along with corn. So please do never do that. So you basically don't produce anything in terms of corn, okay? As compared to the no cover crop treatment, so this is basically a complete loss with uh, annual ryegrass. With crimson clover, it was considerably reduced and was significantly different as well, but, but not as dramatic as this one. And then for the others, there were some uh, you know, uh, differences, but was were uh, significantly different to the no cover uh, treatment as well. So uh, the message here will be, well, two messages at least. One is don't, put cover crops along with corn at the same time, right? Uh, because you are, going to, you are going to lose all your, your yield. And two, even if you are planning to inner seed early in the season, probably we shouldn't do at V2, uh, eventually from V4 to V6 will be okay. So that, that would be the thing. And then we did it again in 2021, a very dry year. And this is what we got. First, our yield from the control was very low because it was very dry. That, that's water effect. And I guess Dr. Strzok was talking about 
uh, the effect of water, you know, in a year like in 2021 that was dry, it was really very interesting that study that uh, Jeff conducted. Uh, for V0, again, very low yield uh, with annual rye grass and with uh, crimson clover, even lower. So there are evidences already that crimson clover really uses lots of water and it will affect a lot the cash crop. And then for when we planted the cover crop at V2, we also had losses, significant losses for with annual rye and with crimson clover. And we, we, when we planted at V4 and V6, guess what? The cover crops did not emerge. And the reason for that is because it was too dry, okay? At the end of the season, when it started raining around uh, mid-August, we saw some cover crops coming, coming up, but it was already late for the cover crops to, to, to get established. So it's interesting. So uh, now let's see how, how it goes uh, when we try to terminate the cover crop uh, in terms of uh, planting green, okay? So this is what we did here. Uh, we see the cover crop in the previous uh, fall. And then, uh, so we saw this in terms of biomass, uh, canopy height and uh, ground cover. So you can see that the termination on May the 21st, which was late, uh, has the best ground cover, which makes sense because it grew much more. And the canopy height was the highest and uh, the biomass produced as well was the highest when we terminated on May the 21st. This is for the cover crop. How that affected the yield of corn? So you can see that the corn, the, the, the control treatment was, was the highest, obviously, and uh, the one planted green was the lowest. Okay, there are two things here. One obviously is that uh, competition that exists when you plant the green uh, at the beginning, but the other is that here, what we did was uh, we terminated the cover crop uh, six days after we planted green, okay? So the corn emerged when the cover crop was still growing. And then when the corn was probably an inch tall, we terminated with, with a herbicide. And this is what happened. So basically, when we are going to plant green, the best at least to have less losses in terms of yield is go ahead, plant green and immediately, immediately terminate the cover crop or not later than 24 hours, okay? If we do wait as we did in this, this study, this is what's going to happen. So you will considerably reduce your, your, your crop yield as well. Uh, so we usually use CDRI as a rate of uh, at a rate of 60 pounds per acre. So, but we have evidences that uh, even if you put 30 pounds per acre, it would be fine. But in our case, we've been consistently using 60 around 60. So in this one, uh, you can see that uh, seeding and termination date uh, have an effect on the production of biomass of that cover crop. So what we did here is we took uh, CDRI and we see it on September the 4th, 16th, 24th, and October the 5th, okay? When we took uh, our fall biomass, which was November 2nd of 2020, of 2020, you can see that the early seeding produced the most uh, biomass and the late seeding produced the least, which it was expected. Uh, in the following year, we terminated uh, one treatment uh, on May the 6th or 7th, and this is what we got. The, sep the September 4th planting produced the most biomass and then it went down to October the 5th. And when we terminated on May 18th, again, this was still high, but also the other two was, uh, were as high as guess, I guess, because the September 16th, probably this is an experimental error, was not as high as this one, okay? but the October 5th was, was still the lowest one. So the bottom line here is that uh, there, is the, there is a best seeding, rate, uh, seeding date and seeding rate for a cover crop as well. And so it, it would be good if we could try to find that and to narrow to our specific objectives in our, in our farm. But the thing here is that we terminated on May the 7th and then uh, this May 7 termination, we kept it there. And then uh, the May 18th, we kept one, one, one treatment growing until the May 18th when we, we came there and planted green, okay? We planted green on May 18th. 
planted corn. So looking the other way, so this is how the cover crop grow, grew uh, based on the uh, seeding date. So it was very nice to see that, you know, uh, it went up, went up, went up, and went up, but again, October the 5th uh, produced the least biomass. Uh, in terms of uh, corn yield, so you see here, this is cover crop terminated on May 18th, and this is cover crop terminated on May, on May the 7th. So you can see here that our uh, planting grain did a little bit better, and it looked like here, like this here. This is a picture from that experiment. I'm not saying that this is uh, significantly different. I did not run the statistics yet, but based on the error here, it looks like there are no differences. But the thing is that also, this was a very dry year. And I am hoping it won't happen again. So here at the station, for example, uh, Jody, I don't know if he's around, but he, Jody told me that uh, I guess the average corn yield here at the station was around 100, 120 bushels, <laughs> when it usually is 160, 180. So and for us here it was very low, okay? But uh, we, we were around what we got as an average here at the station. And then you can see that uh, basically, no matter the, the seeding day, uh, the corn yield did pretty much similar. It was interesting because it looks like the, the best benefit of the planting green in this case was uh, water in the soil, okay? So it helped with this to have these yields here. Now the following, we noticed, and we recorded some stuff with that, that uh, if you plant green, you will delay the growth and development of your corn for at least one growth stage. So our corn in the, in the control treatment uh, got maturity a little bit earlier than the one in the planting green. And the planting green also looked a little bit shorter than the other ones as well. Uh, let me see what else I have here. So just some quick final remarks uh, on cover crops in corn and soybean first. Uh, we know that uh, co uh, cover crops may be seeded early or late in the season with no effect on yield of corn and soybean. And biomass is higher uh, if uh, the early seeded occurs around B4, B6 corn, uh, and the late seeded at R5, R6 corn, and R7, R8 uh, soybeans that we know already that. Uh, if we still after harvesting corn and soybeans, uh, if it's around mid-September, which I doubt is going to be very common, the establishment of the cover crop is usually fine. If we have a late uh, planting, the establishment of the cover crop is marginal, but no worries. Uh, if you are planting cereal rye, it will come up very nicely in the next spring and you are gonna have uh, a good, a good uh, biomass. When it comes to planting green, uh, we know that cover crops grow rapidly in May, they're producing as much as 50% of biomass, uh, of the biomass potential in the first three weeks of that month. Uh, but planting green could, so planting green could allow uh, for high cover crop biomass uh, in this rotation. Uh, the problem is that the practice uh, could affect the productivity of the cash crops. So we need more research to, to come up with something. Uh, from our preliminary results, yield of corn planting green is significantly lower uh, than the corn planted 10 or 14 days after cover crops is terminated. And also the yield of soybeans planting green uh, is not different to the soybean planted uh, after 10, 14 days uh, of cover crops termination. So it's an interesting approach, but uh, we need more work to you know, to come up with something that it has practical uh, consequences. And with that, that's what I had for you guys today. And if there is time for questions, I will try to respond to them. Thank you. Yes, sir. Biomass required for what? Okay, uh, for those online, the question is how much biomass is of cover crops is required to see benefits, is that right? Well, uh, that's a very, it's probably the $100 million question. 
Well, it depends, and I'm going to tell you why. Because one thing is, is if we are in the southeast uh, of the of the country, and another one is if we are here. Uh, but generally speaking, and I'm going to try to come back to your question. Okay, uh, I've seen research that they say that if you want to suppress or reduce uh, with population, you have to produce six to 8,000 pounds per acre of cover crop biomass. Well, that is not gonna happen in Minnesota, okay? That's not going to happen here, but there is another thing that they don't talk about. So as much as it's difficult for the cover crops to grow in our state, it is also difficult for the, uh, for the weeds to grow. So not in the sense that they will grow as slow as the cover crops grow because our weather conditions. So I would say that we need much less biomass from the cover crops in this region than is needed in other parts of the country when it comes to uh, weed control or weed suppression. Back to your question. I've seen that uh, if we are able to produce between 3,000 to 4,000 uh, pounds of uh, biomass per uh, acre, uh, the benefits in terms of nitrogen that is used by the cover crops is much more enhanced, is much better. And also we have a much better ground cover, which helps with soil erosion things. And, uh, and eventually, I haven't done it, but eventually that it will be something that will help also suppressing the growth of, uh, of weeds. But the part of weeds, I haven't done it. We are going to start with that this coming week. I assume the biomass, you talked about the ground. That's the best question. So the, the, the following up question for those online is that uh, the biomass we are talking about is only the above ground. Yes, and that's a big error we are doing because the below ground biomass could be as much as the above ground. And again, uh, we haven't done that here. We have done something, but not much. Uh, but we just got a, a proposal approved that, that we are gonna be looking at the below ground biomass and that's starting this, this year in 2022. Um, what, what else I wanted to say about that? I mean, the, and that's, that's very interesting because we know that when we have corn following cereal rye, for example, usually corn does not do very well in terms of growth and development. And it looks like one of the issues is exactly that, the, the, the below ground biomass. And the problem with that is the carbon nitrogen ratio. It looks like uh, below ground biomass of cereal rye in this case has a CN ratio that is much higher than the above ground biomass. As a consequence of that, so we will need more nitrogen from the soil so the microbes can break down that cellulose and produce uh, and decompose that, uh, that material. So as a consequence, corn will not do as well as it does you know, in other conditions, let's say without cover crop. Good question, thank you. Any other question, guys? Any other? Any question online, Morgan? No? Okay, uh, that's what I have for you guys today. And uh, I hope uh, I brought something for you at least to think about it. And uh, it's been a pleasure to be here today. Who's next? Let's break. Uh, we have a break time. So please enjoy a little bit of coffee and still some, something else to eat there, some donuts.
Okay. Should I call him up? Yep. All right, everybody. We're going to continue the program. If you'd like to uh, take a chair, thanks, Axel. Uh, if you'd like to sit down so we can uh, get started. And I think there might be some people outside too. I see a bunch of uh, folders out and nobody sitting there. All right, I see three, three more seats that have, seems to be people sitting down. Is there anybody back there, Lee? No, and you kept the donuts in here, so I don't know where they are. Oh, I suppose, yeah, they probably don't want to listen to this. All right, everybody, we'll get started. Uh, I'm Paolo Pagliari. Uh, many of you know me already from coming to the, the Center for Talks, and I recognize quite a few familiar faces as well. And for those that don't know me, I do a lot of uh, nutrient management work here. I uh, work on row crops, but also on vegetable crops. Uh, and uh, vegetable crops is that area of the station uh, down the uh, east corner, north corner there that has a fence around it. So we put a fence so the deer doesn't come and eat our tomatoes. Uh, and strawberries, they seem to, to like fussing around with the strawberry plants too. So we put a fence in there to keep them out. Uh, but today I'll be talking to you about a study that uh, the Minnesota Department of Ag and AFRAC have been funding since 2019. Uh, unfortunately, they decided not to fund the continuation of this study into 2022. Uh, but I think the data that we're going to be presenting to you is quite interesting, and I'm going to see if I can continue this study, at least uh, uh, to gather that data, because I think in the near future that data is going to be pretty important to uh, to you guys that grow, grow crops in the state. Uh, when do we look at historic precipitation patterns? I think Jeff has uh, talked a little bit about this. Uh, I don't know if he showed this particular image, uh, but we can see here on the left upper corner, it's very old trend where there wasn't a lot of states that had a very high precipitation. We have the red state, the red bars is less than 500 millimeters. That's about 20 inches of rain. So that uh, northwest corner of the state was known to get less than 20 inches of rain. And then the dark, what is this, purple, blue? I'm colorblind, guys, so I don't know what color this is. I should have had a gray scale. <laughs> so the dark blue is about over 30 inches a year. So you can see there's about uh, more than 10 inches of water between the northwest and the southwest state. Um, uh, and we see that, it, that the wetter region is creeping in and then moving towards the Northwest region, right? Oh, you can't see what I'm pointing at. Maybe you should just use this guy. Right, so we see that all this dark blue is creeping in when compared to these images here, it doesn't really have that much. And then the, the dark uh, red is disappearing. So it's getting more rainfall over the years than right on the average. Now, if you tell that last year, you say like, well, where's that increase, right? Uh, but now when you look at a cumulative uh, rainfall event, here we have the rainfall, the dark line is the long-term average, uh, the yellow line, green line, this yellow line, it's the 2017. And then the bar here, it's uh, our two week total, right? So you can see that as Jeff mentioned, the spring does tend to be wetter than we're getting in the midsummer. Though there seems to be like in July, you'll see that there seems to be a pretty good amount of rain that comes sometime in July. And I think it's what saved us last year. But comparing the long-term trend in last year, uh, pretty much maybe one inch there. So we're not gonna say any credit. We're gonna say it was about even. 2018, we started the year right on target with the long-term average, but then as uh, spring started to peak, we started to see more rain. By summer, there was a lot more rainfall. And at the end of the year, we had 11 inches more rain than we did um, in the long-term average. 2019, a much different story, much wetter spring. We saw this really heavy rainfalls. 
again, not much later on, but it did uh, accumulate. And then by the end of the, the, the rain season, we had about 15 inches uh, more water than the long-term average. You probably don't remember this because the last two years have been drier than average. And that tends to stick a little more. And, and there it is, 2020, uh, we started the year already below average and we never really made it up for. It. We ended up uh, almost as dry as we started the season. Now, 2021, as well, know, it's pretty drastic. It was dry to begin with, uh, very low rainfalls. And I think these rainfalls here is what saved a lot of people. There were some earlier here that we didn't catch, but some of you did catch. And I think that's what really uh, carried that crop uh, for you guys. And again, this is uh, for Lamberton, OK? Uh, we are monitoring in other states as well. Uh, other regions in the state, but I'll show that, that those data later. Again, we end the last year with 11 inches uh, below the long-term average. Now, when you put it all together and look what happened over the last five years, uh, we see again, 2018, there was not, 2017, there was no change, so a 0% increase. 2018, there was a 41% increase compared to the long-term average uh, by the fall. And then 2019, that was a 55% increase. And then 2020, a 16% decrease. In 2021, that was a 44% decrease in total rainfall. But if we were to average this out and see what was the average over the last five years, it would show a positive two inch a year because of this 11 inches here, right? Because these two here will cancel each other out. Then you have 11 divided by five will be two inches. And that's how we say that there's a trend of a wetter, a wetter season. Um, but when I first started this study, we had 2015 and 2016 here, and it was all higher than average. So it seems like there is some higher than average years, but then you also get some lower than average. But overall, it tends to be uh, increasing. And as I was plotting on that data, I, I thought, well, what happens if I am to plot the, the corn yield as a function of total precipitation in the growing season? What do I, will I see? And that's what this is. So that's the 20 year historic Conwood County corn grain average uh, on my y axis. And then I have rainfall total. Now, there's a little trick here. I got the rainfall total from the station and I got the, the corn average from USDA. So whether or not the station is recording the true county average for rainfall or not, I don't know. Uh, but we could go and look at the bulk characters at the, the station and see if it still holds this. Because what I see here is that there's no relationship uh, to the amount of water that we get uh, and the, the amount of grain that we get. Unless it start getting too low, right? If I had the, this year precipitation there, I did not have a county average for this year yet. It's not up online. Uh, but probably will show that it's going to be one of the lowest yield points. It's probably going to be down here somewhere. Where's Jody? Is Jody here? Jody, do you know what the average was for the bulk acres? Like 100? Well, yeah, I was pointing right, right, right there then. It's right here. So it does show that, yeah, when it's really dry, you make a big difference. But if it's really wet, I don't really see that that big deal, but it seems like between 20 to 25 is where we get the best amount of rain. But as Jeff said, it's not about the total, but it's about when it comes and how much is stored in the soil. Because he was showing me some grass that he has that there's enough soil, enough water in the soil in the, in the fall that can carry the crop the whole next year. So it's a little tricky and then just how much is, um, is the rain affecting really the yield. If it's a regular between you know, 17 inches to 40 inches, it's really not gonna impact your corn yield. And then for the snow, just to take a look at what's happening with the snow precipitation as well. Similar to the rainfall, uh, there are years where we have much higher than average. Uh, here's the long-term average is about 44 inches. And then here's what we've been getting for the last five years. Uh, again, 18 and 19, like you saw for the rainfall, was a little higher than average. And here we see much higher snowfall, the position than the average. Uh, and again, last year, it's, it's only up until I think it's December. So there's a little bit more that we're going to add here, but I, I doubt it's going to be much more than um, maybe 40 if we get lucky. 
Now, why did you want to do this study? What drove us to do this? Um, I, I was curious to see what was in the rainfall because we had some studies that we were doing some nitrogen trial, uh, nitrogen rate trials. And we saw that the control plot seems to be yielding quite a bit more than we were expecting. So we thought, well, maybe it's coming down with the rain. So let's test it. So we sampled a couple of rainfalls and then we looked at what was coming down. And just by sampling a couple of rainfalls, the math that I did was like up to 40 pounds of nitrogen. I'm like, well, we need to investigate this and see really what's going on. So we got the, the FDA, the MDA um, to come and fund in. Now what's in the rain? So anything that's up in the atmosphere is gonna come down with the rain. It can be good, can be bad. If there's pollution, it's gonna come down. If there's herbicide drift, it's gonna come down. If it's dust particle, it will come down. If there is uh, forest fire ash that goes up in the atmosphere, that will come down. Uh, volcanic eruption, uh, you name it, it's gonna come down when it rains if it's up in the atmosphere. So the research was set out to look at uh, nutrient concentration in the rainfall and the snow uh, throughout the state. And we had five different locations in Minnesota. Uh, we started out measuring mostly nitrogen and sulfur, but then we saw NPH, but then we saw some weird things. And then we added earth metals to try to understand what's going on, especially with pH. And then here is the locations. So we picked, uh, we try to pick the locations that were within the different uh, precipitation regimes that we have. So there's uh, Wasika and Lamberton, um, and then um, Crookston. And those are mostly, uh, and Becker, those are four agricultural areas and they all have different moisture regime you can see there. But the main thing here is that it's the only sandy location, sandy soil location, it is, is, is irrigated in most of the field there. Then here we have the Cloquet Forest Center. We wanted to contrast all this agricultural land with the forested area to see if there's any difference and try to understand if some of these nutrients are coming down because of the farming or is it because of something else? Is it coming from uh, California? Is it coming from Texas? Come from Africa? Where is all of this coming from, right? China, who knows? So the first thing to look at was pH. So we have the graph here is uh, the rainfall pH as a function of rainfall uh, total amount in inches. Uh, we have here this yellow line. Uh, anybody can take a guess what this yellow line means? So this is what the acid rain would be. Like if you take pristine rainfall and measure the pH, this is what the EPA would tell the pH should be. Now, this dots here is where the pH is. And you have Lamberton, Crookston, Mosica, and the uh, Forest Center. Now, this, this black line, some of you might see red like I do, but maybe some of you may see red, black, whatever you see. Anybody want to take a guess what that is? Back in, in early in the days, maybe in the 80s, this was very, very uh, spoken of. This is, yes, yes yeah, that's acid rain. Um, a lot of the sulfur in the atmosphere primarily was causing the rain to become very acidic. So this is what I would expect. In general, we would expect all the rainfall to be between these two lines. And in fact, we see that the majority, the vast majority, 90%, maybe 95% is well above. And the first thing we thought was, how can that be? It makes no sense because we know, we understand the rainfall pretty well. And, and this is like a little diagram that is on the EPA website. That explains actually how as the rain is formed. If you just have rain, you know, just have uh, moisture coming from the oceans and lakes and rivers, it's usually gonna react with carbon dioxide and sulfates that is emission emitted from uh, volcanic eruptions, uh, primarily which will give you your rainfall with a pH around five. Now you add all this industrialization, then you have nitrous oxide emission, you have more sulfates in, in uh, petroleum that it gets emitted, and that creates a lot more acidity and that creates your acidic rainfall. Now, the, the EPA put out a lot of material there explaining how all of this work. And if you have more curiosity, you can go in and look, but mostly like we should be with our rain right in here. And right now we are right down here. So it, it doesn't make any sense, right? Um, so that's why we decided to add to measure alkaline metals because one of the main sources for alkalinity 
has to be alkaline metals. And alkaline metal would be out in the atmosphere primarily would be through um, burns. First burn would create ashes as the forests are burning. And you know, that's pretty hot. Some of those ashes are very light that can be picked up and carried up in the atmosphere and then move around. Uh, and there has been a lot of um, fires in California, in, in uh, Canada, and it could be the source, right? So that's why we decided that to add those things in there and start measuring. Now let's start looking at some of the nitrogen concentration. First, let's look at the rainfall last year. And I'm most, mostly gonna show last year because it's pretty interesting data. Here in Lamberton, uh, all the way up until October at some point, there was no rainfall that was bigger than a half an inch. So that's why we struggled through that spring and summer. But then later in the summer, late summer, we started getting some of those heavier rainfalls, which saved some of us. Then we're gonna look at nitrate concentration. This is in parts per million, very low nitrate concentration, usually below two parts per million. When you look at ammonium, Jeff and I was talking about this before this talk, ammonia concentration very high, almost up to 16 parts per million. And it's not one isolated event. So we had several events that were over eight parts per million. Now, this graph here is very interesting. You have nitrate on this side and then ammonium on this side. And then this is plotted as a rainfall event. Oh, first, these other three graphs here, the first three graphs we talked about, the rainfall events, nitrate, and ammonium, it's for every single event uh, as they happen. Now here, I'm plotting the concentration as a function of rainfall total. And you can see the most concentrated events are everything below one inch. So what happens is you have uh, an amount of stuff in the atmosphere and you need about one inch of rainfall to wash off the, the atmosphere. After that, then the atmosphere is pretty clean. Whatever additional rainfall that comes, it's gonna be very diluted. There's not gonna be much more nutrients in there. And that's why we see this uh, decrease after one inch. And again, uh, here we look at Crookston, very, very much less rainfall than we got at Lamberton. And we know that the north, uh, northwest part of the state is the one that gets 10 inch less rainfall than we do down here. And you can see that there's much less frequent events as well. And again, before October, everything less than one inch. And then after October, we start seeing those heavier rainfalls that uh, helped, helped uh, save some of the, the plots. But no, I had a, a wheat trial there. You're not gonna believe this, but my wheat trial uh, mean average was 11 bushels. So it was terrible, terrible yield for wheat up there for this particular trial. Uh, nitrate, similar to what we saw in Lamberton, very low concentrations, but ammonium, again, we see some, uh, some events that have very concentrated ammonium. And when we plot this data on uh, concentration as a function of uh, total rainfall deposition, again, we see this, uh, this pattern that most of the nutrients are coming down with the lower uh, rainfall events, which emphasize that the atmosphere get washed off within about an inch of rainfall. Now here are contrasting uh, location. This is at the forest center. They did not have the issue with the rainfall at all. And look at how much more uh, distributed it is. There is no single event more than an inch and a half. In other locations, we had two, three inches events. Uh, some years in Mexico, we have four or five inches rainfall event. But at the Cloque, pretty, pretty stable um, rainfall events and well distributed. Nitrate concentration are fairly low. And ammonium as well is fairly low. So the highest here is two. And then the lamp thing you saw, it could be as most as 16. So it does seem to show that could be ag related, right? Especially all this ammonium could be ag related and it's not transferring to the, the forest center. And again, for the concentration as a function of yield, we did get this one guy here that's high, but it's right at the borderline there, the one inch event. So I'll say it still holds, holds true for the data. Now, the interesting part, uh, the first year of the study, we only measured inorganic nitrogen and total sulfur. Uh, and we had mores in there, we did not have the forest center. We dropped mores and we added the forest center to add that forest background to see if there was an egg and forest difference. 
But basically what we saw is not much nitrate, less than a pound coming down per acre. Ammonium, not that much. Like I told you before, I thought that was potential for four, 40 pounds. And then if we go back, you know, and you look here, like for example, in Crookston, we had those events of more than 10 ppm. If I take one of those events, and then I assume that that's the average concentration, and then I multiply that by total rainfall, yes, that's gonna give me a lot more nitrogen than really there is, especially when I showed you that less, more than one inch doesn't really have a lot of nitrogen. There's quite a few events that carry a lot of water in there. So it's still up 13 pounds. And then total sulfur, there wasn't a whole lot as well, between four to 10 pounds. But then in 2000, uh, 2020, we decided to also test for total nitrogen. We're having issues with sulfur, we dropped sulfur, and we added total nitrogen. And then we also added a lot of this uh, earth metals, right? All this um, nutrients here that would carry acidity. Um, and then what we see is nitrate is still, uh, still very low and also added total phosphorus. So it's not much, uh, not much at all phosphorus coming down. Jeff, what did you tell me that the phosphorus in uh, drainage water is? Yes, that's the annual basis. Okay, so that's 10% at the most of what is in drainage water. So it's not, not a lot of phosphorus coming down. Um, and then when you look though at total nitrogen, then it's a different story, primarily in Southwest and Northwest. Um, I, don't know, I don't know how it is throughout you know, different years. So this was the first year that we measured total in, and it was quite a surprise when you saw this, it's about 15%, uh, 15 pounds is organic nitrogen. Now, I don't really know how organic nitrogen can be getting up there, but the data shows there's quite a bit of organic nitrogen. And one of the reasons to continue this study is to look at um, the trend that we see in different years, right? Is this another year or is this the actual what happens every year? Or do we see more organic can coming in at the different locations? Now, what the interesting thing is there's not much of this, uh, this other strong elements that would control pH, but look at phosphorus and potassium, right? I mean, 20 pounds of uh, calcium, 20 pounds of potassium, that's quite a bit. And then you look at the CFC, 18 pounds of potassium. Again, potassium is one of those that could be related to ash, but it's hard to really understand how you get 20 pounds of potassium coming down in a forested area, right? It's really mind boggling. Uh, and even in agricultural fields, how, how do they get that much potassium in there? It's, it's quite interesting. So I don't really have an answer for you right now. The only thing I'm saying it's due to forest uh, fires. If that turns out to not be true, then your questions are my question as well. Now for 2021, uh, since there was such little events, we didn't really analyze all the data. And Jeff told me that the total win is just got finished. Uh, so I'll be updating this table with that. And then the alkaline metals, this one is very expensive to run. We have to buy gas cylinders and they cost about $1,700 for two cylinders. And also buy them, we have to use it within 30 days, otherwise the gas just leaks out. So if you buy the tank and don't use it, within 30 days, you lose 1,700 bucks. So we saved this for the last month in the study, which is March. And then we just run everything and complete the trial. So that's uh, what I wanted to present it to you in terms of this particular study that we are doing. Uh, and if you have any questions, I can try to answer. Don't ask me what the source of potassium is because I don't know. Yes, Jeff. Yeah, so for those online that couldn't hear the question. Yes, yes. So the question was, uh, what's the, the reason for the ammonia? Is it uh, like uh, other species that can transform once it gets in the atmosphere? Or is it mostly due to ammonia volatilization from soils? Um, I think it's a bit of, of ammonia volatilization from soils, uh, manure volatilization, but 
there is no source of, uh, there is no chemical reactions that we know of that would convert nitrous oxide or nitrates into ammonium in the atmosphere because that the reduction reaction, it's, it's governed by microorganisms. So you would have to have some sort of microorganism up in the atmosphere to do that conversion. And we don't really know that to be true. So I think right now it's ammonia volatilization and manure would be the main sources of ammonium up in the atmosphere. Now, there is all that organic nitrogen, which a lot of it could be urea. I did a little bit of search and there is a lot of urea that could be in coastal rainfall, right? But as of lately, a lot of our moisture for our precipitation is coming from the Gulf of Mexico. The Gulf of Mexico is struggling with a lot of algae bloom. I don't know what algae bloom does to urea in a, in a, in a sample, but to have that much ammonia uh, and urea, I'm thinking that it's related. Maybe there's too much uh, algae bloom in the Gulf that's creating a lot of urea and that's being picked up with uh, the moisture and, and being deposited throughout the, the state. So it'd be nice to, to try to track as the states down south of us and see if that trend holds. It would be one way to track where that all that organic end is coming, coming from. But it's, it's a trick question, yeah. Um, it, it could, you know, but you would have to be burning a lot, right? Because the concentration, and you would have to be burning frequently because the concentration is pretty much constant. So it's up in there throughout the year. So it has to be a forest fire that is going on every day, you know? So it has to be something constant. Anybody else? Yes. Uh, in the atmosphere or in the soil? Did you say microbial life? Yes. That's true, yes. That there's a lot of soil that gets picked up and lifted and there's microbes in there. But I don't know how, how it would interact. There is the opportunity, it's there. There's the moisture, there's the soil and microbes and all of these other nutrient sources. So maybe it is, Jeff, and maybe it is something related to microbial up in the atmosphere that could be driving a lot of these uh, reactions and we don't know because we don't really, there's not really that much studies that looked at organic nitrogen uh, in the atmosphere and the very few that did linked to ocean urea and coastal areas. So the ocean has a lot of urea in the water uh, and gets deposited on, on the region near to the ocean. There's no reports like what I'm reporting here, you're not gonna find anywhere else. Even the EPA doesn't measure this. The EPA total, Nitrogen deposition the that they measure, Lee can affirm this because he does a lot of the collection for them. I think it's about eight pounds total in organic N that comes down. I think that's what we looked at. So even EPA is not really aware that this is taking place. So it's a mystery. All right, thank you everybody. I thought it was gonna bring us back to uh, the schedule, but I guess not. What do I do here, Molly? Like, close it, and maybe Bruce, uh, who is up? Who is next, Jeff or? Um, Our next speaker is uh, from uh, the land of Lake Fall over in Watsika, and uh, he's gonna talk about uh, corn and soybean weed management. Is this the point I'm using? I've been using this one. This one? If you want, I can just buy it for the other one. I'll yeah, I've been using the key power. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, Bruce mentioned I'm from the land of rainfall. Well, we didn't have a lot this year. And I think it impacted some of the weed work we do. I'm going to share with you some of the things we've learned in our weed trials 
using the work that a number of us at the university do, myself included. Uh, Bruce and Travis here have some uh, work we, we do together. Or there's a group down at Rochester. And in your handouts, there's a big spreadsheet of our corn trials and our soybean trials, kind of the results from this year. And, and I'd like to take a minute to kind of reflect on how that's migrated a little bit through the years. Um, I've been doing this for quite a while, Bruce as well, and there was a time when a lot of the work that we did was trying to pair certain products. You know, somebody had uh, a pre-herbicide such as Harness, and then they'd say, well, here, we want to look at it with something tank mix to pick up uh, ragweed or whatever. We spent a lot of, and the industry and the reps worked a lot to try to put something together for you. That was back when we would meet with about a dozen different manufacturers. Well, in the last several years, there's been a lot of mergers, acquisitions in the industry. Now we sit down with about a half a dozen. And I was looking at the trials this year and, and, I, and, I, and a Corteva rep came to and we both said the same thing. You know, everybody's pretty much got you covered now from when, when you, when you, plan your weed control system, whether you're talking to a guy with a Bayer cap or a Syngenta, they've pretty much got a complete package for you, which makes it more of a one-stop shopping. And I, and I think our trials really show that, that we don't see many failures, but every year in agriculture is a learning experience. And I'll share a few things we learned this year. Uh, Bruce mentioned that we come from the land of rainfall, but this year, was a unique spring for us. And I think the same was true for you. We had really dry weather. Now, typically when I talk about dry weather and soil applied herbicides with you guys, it usually means trouble. But this year, what I saw was, was something I probably haven't seen in my 40 years of doing this. It was dry enough that I don't think a lot of our weeds came in that top, a lot of them come from the top half quarter inch. It was so dry there. We planted corn at two inches deep, it came up good, we had a good stand here. Not every field, I think there was some problems with stand uh, establishment in corn. Maybe it was dry enough that the seed zone, but we planted our corn where there was moisture. And that's a testament to corn itself, how little moisture you can scratch out of there and corn will still germinate and grow. But the weeds didn't come. And I said, well, what's going to become of these herbicides? We put on these pre-chemistries. Well, I think when it did rain late in May, and we, they were still there. I, I guess I learned something that unless the soil leaves, I think the herbicide stays there because we got good activity. It was really the crop helped itself. It came up early, got ahead of the weeds. Well, two, three weeks later, when the weeds decided it was time to come because we got some of that rain, the chemistry was still there. It really turned out to be pretty good. But I'm going to go through quickly the corn. And, and I've, I've got some other learning opportunities we had this year. But uh, here's one thing. Pre-emergence, one pass weed control. Now, in the history of our trials, I've usually had a difficult time making that work. Now we do our trials on weedy sites. We, we try to get a good weed population. And that was, I, I'm a probably a rare breed out there when I was out in our plots this spring saying, I'm really disappointed that the weeds aren't growing. Most of you would never say that in your field. But we, we try to get weeds now. And what's come through the system in the last years that I've been impressed with was Acuron as far as a one pass, grass and broadleaf season long soil applied product. I've been impressed with Acuron. Well, Syngenta this spring said, we're not gonna do that anymore. We're not gonna look at one pass Acuron. One, one company did, uh, they wanted us to look at Corvus and Atrazin as a one pass. Worked pretty good this year. I've got in your sheets, uh, I've got a pre-emergence rating. That's, that's a a rating that we do before any of the post-emergence portion of the treatments have gone on. So that gives you a look at what the soil applied chemistry is doing for us. Then there'll be another rating later that covers 
kind of the final rating. And the broadleaf weeds. Now, I'll go over that. Uh, the grass weeds. Actually, I wanted to mention that. Barnyard grass. I'm seeing more barnyard grass than I've seen in a long time. Uh, what's different about barnyard grass? Two things to keep in mind. It's a little larger seeded. As far as grass, products for control in corn and soybeans. What, what about barnyard grass that would make it more difficult? It's larger seeded, so some of our soil applied chemistry doesn't work as well on larger seeded weeds. Woolly cup grass, barnyard grass. Foxtails are pretty easy to control with a lot of our group 15s, harness, stir pass, those kind of things, dual. The larger seeded grasses more often can come through that. Glyphosate's not particularly strong on barnyard grass. We've used a lot of barnyard, we've used a lot of glyphosate over the years. I'm seeing about 10 years ago, if I saw a barnyard grass, it was time to slam on the brakes, get out and look and make sure it was that. Now I drive by it and say, oh, it's just another barnyard grass. So it's, it's on the increase. Uh, we got in our plots, and this is kind of an average across all of them. A couple sites have common ragweed. All three of our sites, Rochester, Lamberton, and Wasika have lambs quarters. Cockleburr they have here at Lamberton this year. I've got some velvet leaf and that's uh, the amaranthus species. I've still got some plain old pigweed in our trials because we've let a lot of them go, but by and large, the amaranth weeds that we're dealing with is water hemp now. So when you look at that, you can kind of use that column for, for water hemp. But like I said, most of the companies, if you go to Syngenta and say, take care of me in corn, they'll say, I'll do that. And if they're gonna do a one pass program, you might, your responsibility now is to tell them, hey, I've got cockleburr out there. That's gonna make a difference, okay? And when we look at the final ratings, you'll see it, it, it came out quite different. Now, I'm not gonna go through every one of these, but this is a testament to what happened this spring, especially at the Wasika where I've got giant fox tail. I saw very little emergence before we put on any of our post-emergence products. I mean, we had good control. Nature helped us, the chemistry helped us. It was a unique season that way. Rochester has woolly cup grass, a little bit tougher to control with the broadleaf, pro, uh, the uh, grass uh, herbicides we use. It's a little larger seeded, and I'd put barnyard grass in that same category. Keep that in mind as you as you think about your weed management. Um, oh, the broadleaf weeds in the same system. I got great broadleaf weed control across the board this year. Not so much the case with some of the tougher to control broadleaves like cockleburr. <clears throat> Even ragweed, I had, did a pretty darn good job on. Going back to the final rating with that one pass, okay. If we're gonna miss something, usually it's grasses and they, they fell off a little bit, especially with woolly cup grass, but I wanted to make a note of what happened at Lamberton when you have cockleburr. That's where I said that's, that's going to be your responsibility to know what weeds are out there and talk to your reps about what's going on. If they give, bring you a package, make sure you mention, I've got this problem. So that's what, I, that's what I'm going to say about the corn program. You can look at your sheets. We had good results. I think you're going to have success with a number of the reps you deal with. There's always learning opportunities in soybeans. Now, this year, and we planted our soybeans a little bit later, so I got better weed, better weeds coming, probably about a week later. I think I planted the corn roughly the first to the fifth of May, and we didn't get much rain until May 24th. <clears throat> Beans were probably planted more like May 10th. So we got a better flush of weeds and better, a better look at things. Now we used the Enlist E3 soybeans in our trial this year. So the, we've got Extend, we've got Enlist, uh, fairly similar in terms of now we have growth regulators to use in soybeans. So what do we do in those systems? A lot of times we, 
We still look at a lot of soil active chemistry and what are we expecting from them? What's been our biggest challenge in soybeans is getting water hemp control season long. And the answer has usually been soil active chemistry. The growth regulators work pretty well, especially on small water hemp. <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me. But season long still is a challenge, and we're still looking at a lot of things we have to do to supplement some of the uh, soil active chemistry. So we looked at a host of products, Zidua, Sonic, Authority Ed, Surveil. There's a lot of those products that we can use soil applied ahead of something like Enlist or Extend. What are we looking at? We usually don't look at grass control as a main feature of those, we're usually trying to pick up a broadleaf. Could be water hemp, could be ragweed. Most likely all of us need to deal with lamb's quarters. Fortunately, lamb's quarters, everybody has it. You couldn't walk across the parking lot without finding a lamb's quarter somewhere. But it usually does pretty well. A lot of our products work pretty well. Even the growth regulators work pretty well. So lamb's quarters is something we need to pay attention to, but it's usually pretty easy to control. Water hemp's been a problem. Biologically, it's provided us more of a challenge because it keeps coming late into the season. After some of our soil applied chemistry isn't working, we have warm soil temperatures. It's hard to make those things work when the, when the biology of the weed is working so fast at those warm soil temperatures. That's why it's been such a problem. Ragweed, some of the larger seeded broadleaves have been a problem in soybeans too, because a large seeded broadleaf weed in a large seeded broadleaf crop provides a challenge. But we're looking at a lot of these products, soil applied, and that's the thing. Um, yes. On the fat app for your steam 4 and tall water hemp. Question was, uh, what are we seeing for HPPD resistance in tall water hemp? I've not worked a lot on that myself. <clears throat> the HPPD inhibitors are pr products like uh, Callisto, that family, the, uh, the ones that turn the weeds white. Now water hemp is showing up that some of them have the capability. Now, I think we're all familiar that water hemp, we can no longer control with glyphosate. We did, we did a good job with it right away. That lasted probably about four or five years. <clears throat> Water hemp is a cross-pollinated species. And when one shows some resistance, it usually carries through genetically very quickly. In our trials, I'll say that we don't have any HPPD resistant water hemp, probably because we've had a lot of controls through the years where we don't we control plots where we don't do anything. We let our, our water hemp and our pigweed family of weeds is going to morph a lot more slowly. But that's something to keep an eye out for. Water hemp seems to find resistance to products and it seems to get that gene through its system pretty quickly. Uh, I was talking about <clears throat> the soybean systems. Now we're usually picking up something that we try to help with some broadleaf weeds. Here's Here's one that wasn't, I think this is uh, Authority Edge, I think, and there's a quite a bit of ragweed that came through that. So now we need to deal with our, some of our breakthroughs post-emergence. Usually it's water hemp, can be ragweed. Lots of times it's lamb's quarters. Lamb's quarters can be a problem physically because it comes up early. A lot of times our tillage doesn't take care of it. By the time you're spraying herbicides, it can be as tall as a foot. That can be a problem. So keep an eye on lamb's quarters that way. Soil applies usually work pretty well on it, as long as we do a good job of starting without any lamb's quarters that's growing. <clears throat> now, in these trials, enlist as our growth regulator, the package, the E3 soybeans, pretty good, pretty good broadleaf weed control across the board this year. We've seen a lot of success in that program. And I wanted to, oh, here's, here's something 
that the industry has come to us too. A lot of people are somewhat interested in a soil applied and an early post. When we do that, most of them are stacking that early post with something with some soil activity. There's sequence within lists. There's liberty with dual. There's liberty with outlook. So that's the trend, trying to keep some soil active chemistry out there as long as we can. That's what's helping with water hemp. And we've had good broadleaf weed control across the board with those. Here's something and I've, I've wondered about myself. Now, whether you're in the extend flex and list, we now have several post-emergence options for you. You can use glyphosate, you can use glufosinate, glyphosate is Roundup, glufosinate, Liberty. You've got a growth regulator, be it maybe the extend program, with Dicamba or the Enlist program with 2,4-D. So we've got a lot of things you can use. Liberty being one of them, blue positive. What's better? And I've, I've got a lot of experience using Liberty. And I will say that Liberty, I've never thought of as a late type rescue herbicide. My original thoughts were, if you're gonna use Liberty, <laughs> In these systems, I would prefer to see you use it early. That's, that was my conventional thinking, my experience. But I talked to a lot of people and they said, you know, I've invested in this system. Be it extend or enlist. That's what I'm going to key my application on. It's going to be the dicamba or the 2,4-D. That's going to be my key application. Liberty, I might use. I'm probably not going to key my application on Liberty. It's probably going to be the second application I make. But we looked at it both ways in these trials. Here's a list down, two-inch weeds, follow it up with Liberty. This is what I thought probably wouldn't be the best situation. Most people would, I thought, maybe using Liberty early and then following it up with the growth regulators because I know Liberty coverage is an issue. Weed size, I've never thought of it controlling large weeds. But in our trials, it worked either way. And I think a lot of people probably had success with it both ways. But we've got a new weed scientist, Evelyn, who was interested in this very question. Like I said, you've got glufosinate over here. You've got glyphosate. We've got, they looked at the enlist system in this. You know, what, what should I apply and when should I apply? It's kind of how, well, don't forget, we've also got conventional herbicides we can use. So they did a trial on, on is there a best way to do it? And this is, this is work that I wasn't involved with. Uh, I, I got it from uh, Ryan Miller, who's an extension weed scientist, and, and they were, he got this from Devlin, but I think it tells a little lesson about how we can maybe do this. Three timings, early post-emergence, like V1. Mid post, more like V3. Late post, R1. That's probably a key. I think R1 is, is probably something you always want to keep in mind when you're dealing with soybean herbicides. Most of our products, once soybeans start flowering, we need to be done with them. Liberty especially. Its label says R1 is the end. So they had a lot of treatments in here. First of all, half the trial, they put Warrant down as a soil applied product. Then they would look at Liberty early post. That's what I thought if I was thinking about how Liberty works and how I have good luck with it. That's what I probably would think about. Here's your core treatment. I mean, you've, you've invested in that system. You bought the E3 soybeans. You're going to use those products. Uh, tank mixing Durango with, with Enlist, or there is a, an Enlist dual product too. Occasionally they added some more chemistry with some soil activity. And they looked at a possibly a later post, R1. This would be like the end, okay? Well, here's one lesson to learn for sure. And I think we're all gonna agree with this. Here's the water hemp density when they used 
Warren, really low. Those products work on water hemp, and that's why we're using a lot of them. It's this side of the graph that I'm kind of interested in, where we, where we had a water hemp problem for whatever reason, and it happens to people. Maybe their soil applied chemistry didn't work as well as it did here. Whatever the reason is, we've had a lot of water hemp breaks in soybeans. So here's where there was the pre down really good control across the board. Okay. Water hemp, Liberty by itself once or twice. What are these control ratings? Something like 60, 70%. That's not acceptable. You're not going to be happy with that. I've seen Liberty on water hemp. What happens to it? Especially if they're large, it does a pretty decent job. It, it burns them back, but water hemp has the ability to regrow from buds. And in about two weeks to a month, what you thought was dead, all of a sudden it looks like you never even touched it. They really, they really can come back fast. <clears throat> We can get in trouble that way. That's why some soil applied chemistry really helps out. Over on this side, I was curious about what's working over here, providing them, you know, this, these lines are the range in wheat control. The spots are their averages, but it looks like treatment 16, treatment 12, treatment 13, provided the best water hemp control in this situation. Uh, I got to back up to find out what was 16 and list down Liberty Lake. That's not exactly what I thought would be the best. I thought we'd use Liberty first and get it, get it to work its best. But it seems as though that later application Liberty following, here's dual down even with that. So following those, I think it's working out better than what I thought. Okay, so I think the good news is it's working either way. I think using Liberty after your growth regulator portion is probably not too bad. Along with that, they also looked at lambs quarters in the same situation. As long as you had a growth regulator, lambs quarters were working good. What didn't work well? These treatments that just had Liberty. Liberty's never been a great lamb's quarters product. And I'm not sure why. It doesn't, I've, I've, coverage is important. Lamb's quarters has some pretty waxy leaves. I've always needed, and I have told the industry reps, I said, if you can come to me with something that guarantees good lamb's quarters control with Liberty, you're going to do okay. Here's some pictures of those plots. Here's Liberty, one pass early post. I know coverage is important. Even if they have warrant down, followed by Liberty early post, lambs quarters was an issue. When they put the growth regulator in there, now you've got three modes of action. That's when they did pretty well. Another question, tank mixing. We fascinate with some of these growth regulators. Is it a good idea? And I will tell you from my experience with Liberty, <clears throat> coverage is important. What do they want you to do with these growth regulators? Use those TTI nozzles, large droplets. Coverage probably isn't the best. So does it make sense to mix those? I think maybe even chemically Liberty works pretty fast. It's a contact type herbicide. Mixing it with these products in the same tank doesn't use Liberty the way it is best to be used. I think it even kind of takes away a little bit of the growth regulator activity. Well, I must have to bring up another. Let's look at, here's number two. Bar number two is Extendamax on water hemp. If you added Liberty with it, it brought water hemp control down. Wouldn't expect that because why would it why would it make it worse? Probably just some antagonism. Well, not, wait, number three is liberty by itself. That I would expect. It's it doesn't have that much control all by itself. Okay, here's <coughs> the max. 
with Liberty, it brings it down. So tank mixing Liberty, especially when you're talking about TTI nozzles, I don't think is using Liberty the best way it can be used. I had one more thing I wanted to share with you guys. There's sort of a system here. We had a hooded sprayer that we were asked to use this year. And I think I learned a couple things that I can share with you that you can bring home from this today. The hooded sprayer, what was the purpose of that? Okay, we were to use it in a soybean field. This is uh, Bex soybean seed. It was a, uh, a GT27, normal soybean. Uh, in the middle of that, we planted some extend flex. We were to use an open boom and a hooded boom sprayer on these extend flex to put extend on in a field of non dicamba tolerant beans. Okay. Here we are out there with that hooded sprayer. <coughs> they wanted us to do it in the wind. We had to wait for the right wind. And this was a windy day. I don't have any video. But it's one of those days I think you see those clouds are coming over fast. It was breezy that day, about 15 mile an hour winds. A lot of springs, we don't have to wait for that. But this year, I had to wait. We, the day that everybody came to do it, it was forecast to get windy. It never did. So I, we waited about, it was, this was on a Monday. I watched the news on Sunday and I called our guys. I said, come in. We're going to do that hooded sprayer trial. I need everybody because we had to put lots of things out. It took a lot of us to do it. One thing we did is we put these papers out. And this is what I wanted to show you. With the hooded boom, we used the AI or XR, the flat fan type tips. The open boom, we did what you, what you have to do with dicamba. You got to use the TTIs, larger droplets. They don't like to see any particle drift with dicamba. The hooded boom should help minimize the particle drift. And they use the smaller, the smaller droplet size. That to me says, does Liberty belong in that tank with TTI tips? And my BAS ref has, my BASF rep has always told me when you're spraying Liberty, don't use the TTI tips. It's not the best situation. Therefore, tank mixing with that is probably not the best. But I also wanted to show you what that field looked like. Remember, I sprayed. June 21st. Here's the field on July 16th. What do you see? I see lots of dicamba showing up on these soybeans. Here's the hooded boom. The row right next to it. Here's the tolerant soybeans, the extend flex beans. This row with the open boom. I think you see that row. So did the hooded boom do what it's supposed to do? I believe it did. It created less particle drift. What's causing these soybeans to cup? I'm not sure if it's particle drift or if it's volatility, but we see too much of this in dicamba beans. Unexplained cupped beans all over the place. And it takes a while. Here's that. <coughs> this is a picture of a roll, the roll right next to, well, not the roll right next to it. That, that happened right overnight. This is. 10 meters away, the first row they had us look at. July 2nd, I still didn't see any symptoms. July 6th, maybe starting to see some symptoms. July 15th, now I think you can see. And well into July, about a month later, still dicamba showing up. That's, I've, I've got a lot of experience with growth regulators and soybeans. They've always had us do this for training purposes. When I see growth regulator injury show up on soybeans, I got some rules of thumb. If, it, if, it, if it's really bad, if it showed up overnight, you'll know what happened. Like the hooded boom. We sprayed that. I mean, we were right on that road. You knew that was going to be trouble. If they wilt and die overnight, you're going to know what happened. But when you're a half a mile from some field and you see injury like this, those are ultra low rates of dicamba and it can really be unexplained. Of course, I rated injury. Here's a week after application, no injury. <clears throat> a month later, I'm seeing some injury. But I wanted to share one thing with you guys. Now, here's, here's a picture of the field again. 
I took soybean yields row by row. Here's our block of dicamba beans. That first row next to the open boom, remember it looked pretty bad. Well, it was, it only yielded eight bushels. Jump to that next row, we're back to 67 bushel beans. Even though we had all that cupping. So my point is that cupping, even though we see a lot of it, and we got to figure out some way to not make that happen. I think early applications is a good key. But when it happens, it doesn't mean we've lost yield. We can have a lot of cupped beans. And you saw the pictures. They yielded very well. Yes. This year was kind of unique. We saw a lot of cupping well before any dicamba got sprayed. This comment was we saw a lot of cupping well before dicamba got sprayed. Well, I don't. You know, soybeans can cup all by themselves. I've seen that before. And especially in certain conditions, dry conditions, maybe do it. Leaf cupping is a response to hormones. And when you add those growth regulators, it's overdosing it with hormones and it makes it do that. Plant hormones can do that by themselves. Other things that I've seen make soybeans cup is like surfactants in some products. I've seen that happen before. So not all cupping means it's dicamba. Not all, it doesn't. And when you see some cupping that you're sure is dicamba, it might've come from quite a ways away and it might've been a month after application too. But with a couple of conclusions that I wanted to share with you guys, we had a hood sprayer trial off target. Now there's three things that we have to deal with when we're talking about growth regulators on soybeans. Particle drift, volatility, non-target species sensitivity. Of those three issues, which one is the worst? In my opinion, it's this. It's the one you can't do anything about anyway. Non-DT soybeans are so sensitive that any amount of dicamba in the atmosphere seems to make them do that. Doesn't mean it's a problem, but we have to be careful with it. Did the hooded spray help with particle drift? I believe it did. Would it help? And maybe this is what they're after, maybe reducing some of this buffer and all those, so, you know, the field edge buffers. That's probably what they're looking at. Doesn't help with volatility, doesn't help with the other species, but it does help with particle drift. And I think I'll, I'll be quiet there, we'll keep the program moving. Jeff and I'll stick around. You can discuss any of this if you'd like. We'll be around for at least uh, 15 minutes to a half hour after Jeff is done. Tom, there was a question in the chat from someone who said, I sent TWH survivors to University of Illinois for molecular resistance identification. 87% of the samples came back as PTO resistant. Does this mean the TWA in populations will also be PTO resistant to PPE PPO timing. These samples came back 100% EPSP synthate resistant. Oh, that's a big, he's got tall water hemp. He sent it to Illinois, and that's where they do a lot of this herbicide resistance testing. 87, 87% or something were resistant to PPOs. So I would say that's going to be, that's going to preclude you from using PPO inhibitors on that. Bruce's comment was post-emergence or pre-emergence. I'm not so sure that, it, I think if it's PPO resistant, I think the soil applied may have some effect on it, but I, I'm not the person to talk to about the resistance on that. So I would forward that on to possibly Devlin or another, uh, I haven't seen enough, I don't have enough experience with all those resistant populations to know the ins and outs of that. So I'd, I'd move that on to uh, some of the industry reps and see what they say about that. Thank you. Right, last but not least, we got Jeff, Jeff also from the highest 
And some people uh, might want to just like pay taxes, but usually they do that with a different plant. It's the one with, uh, with fertilizer and all that stuff. Hmm. Trying to get the cursor or the mouse, but I'm not, I guess I'm just going to get the cursor. That's fine. Cursor's fine. Sure. Yeah, I don't okay. need the mouse. Can you guys hear me if I just stand here by this microphone? All right. So as Bruce said, I'm going to talk about improving your fertilizer return on investment for 2021. But I'm guessing nine out of 10 of you have already purchased your fertilizer for 2021, maybe even higher. Um, and if you purchased it in July or August, you were the winners. <laughs> if you purchased it sometime after that, or you haven't purchased it, you're probably going to be the losers as the costs have gotten higher and higher. However, these things I'm going to tell you today are going to apply to next year and probably the year after that, the way it looks. So, so I'm going to give you kind of my answers right up front. Doesn't mean you have to leave after this, but then we're going to I'm going to show you the data that supports these answers. So should fertilizer guidelines or rate recommendations be adjusted as prices change? So for corn, our key nutrients are N, P, K, and S. For nitrogen, you can use the N rate calculator. Uh, I'll show you some examples. It does the adjustment for prices of corn and prices of fertilizer as nitrogen gets more expensive. It does that right for you. And we're going to talk about some of the implications of what we're going to see in this next chart. For phosphorus, I've got this in bold. This is the greatest potential for you to save fertilizer dollars on input costs for 2022's crop and probably for 2023's crop. And I'll explain why when we get into some of the data. For potassium, um, recent studies that Dan Kaiser and I and myself have done has shown that, that we've actually seen a greater need for K. We've adjusted our recommendations, our levels or our ranges, we've raised them up. We've seen more responses to higher rates. So I don't think at this time it'd be, potassium would be a nutrient that I would cut back on on applications to save money. But we'll look at the critical values and we'll explain where the critical values are and how that imply or implicates whether you should be applying and how much you should be applying. Sulfur, the need for sulfur on most Minnesota soils for corn is there. Um, it's just a matter of what source you use. Elemental sulfur, something like Tiger 90, is not very as, as efficient or as effective as a sulfate source like AMS or gypsum has sulfate sulfur. ATS, or ammonium thiosulfate, is a combination. And then the micronized uh, products like MES and MSTs, those have very finely ground elemental sulfur, and that becomes available a lot faster and works more like um, or sulfate sources, even though it's an elemental and has to go through the oxidation, it's a lot quicker. So those, the source is the key thing, rates is probably where you make your changes. From soybeans, it'd be phosphorus again, it's the greatest economic potential for saving money on input costs. Potassium, our return on investment for K, you know, if you're at that 150 part per million K with ammonium acetate test or above, you probably don't need a lot extra, but that's kind of where you need to be for medium and fine textured soils. One thing that I didn't mention that I should come back to is this irrigated sands. Um, I doubt many of you are farming irrigated sands down here in southwestern Minnesota, but our recent data has shown that we probably reduced the uh, critical values of our irrigated sands for K, and we've actually reduced our rates as well. So, so we'll move on to the next slide. That's interesting. Why does it do that, Mom? Oh, maybe it's because I'm not. Oh. Okay. So it's just locked up. Stuck on this slide.
Oh, do they get off? That's that could be the problem. Yeah, so I need to be back here. Where's your screen share? No, let's see if it would that's it's it may be you might be right, it might be stuck and it has to be on your screen. So the next slide was going to be on nitrogen and is uh, looking at the NRATE calculator and scenarios with different prices, prices from last year in March of 2021 and prices from the spring, summer, fall, and also if you went to uh, make a purchase here in late fall. There it's back. Now oh, it's advancing. There we go. Thank you. So we're back in business. So maybe I should not use the mouse, but so as I said, the blue line here, these are from the corn NRA calculator for corn on corn. The blue line here is March, 2021, where the price of corn was about $5 and the price of N was about 40 cents. That's where the winners were. Everyone, anyone that planted corn last year was in that boat. July of 21, corn was still about 550. Price of N had went up to about 60 cents. That's this red or maroon line. When we go to the green one, October of 21, corn, price of corn was still about 550, but now the price of N went up to about 80 cents per pound of N. And now in the spring of 2022, if you're purchasing either in December, January, or any time later, Price of corn is maybe five, maybe six dollars, but just for math, easy math, we're going to leave it at five. But now the price of N is probably at least a dollar per pound of N or more. So that gives us these price ratios over here on the top right. And those price ratios are 0 0.08, 0 0.11. And typically we give recommendations as using the 0 0.1 price ratio. And that's kind of, these are pretty typical. Then we go to 0 0.15, and that five dollar corn. Now that says four, but it should be five. Five dollar corn dollar N is gives you a price ratio of 0.2. So these are the profit curves um, at this N rate. This is your profit curve at those different ratios. The blue line being the uh, 0.08, the orange line or reddish line being at the 0.11, the green line being at 0.15, and now you drop all the way down here to that 0.20 curve. And what you see is the diamond in the middle is the MRTN value. That's the maximum return to nitrogen based on the database. The points on the outside are the profitable end rate range. So applying anywhere within that range is acceptable and, and usually within plus or minus a dollar of profitability. And then the where it is on this Y axis over here is the return to nitrogen in dollars per acre. So what you see is when this value goes to 0.2 or that price ratio, $5 corn, $1 nitrogen, or $5.50 corn and $1.10 nitrogen, look at how you've eaten away about $100 to $150 of your profit for every pound or for that nitrogen investment. But the other point that I want to get to is the actual acceptable range and what I think is acceptable. So here at 0.08 or 0.11, we're looking at 174 to 180, somewhere in there, 165 is our MRTN with an acceptable range up to maybe 180. I think that's appropriate for corn on corn today. But when you get over here to the far right and you have this, this 0.2 price ratio, the MRTN now is down to 144 pounds of N for corn on corn. And the, price, and the acceptable range, I believe, is 132 to 152. I would not feel comfortable with that. Th that is not enough. And I think this, this corn end rate calculator is a great, it's a database system, but I don't think it was designed for 0.2 or, 0.2 or greater price ratios. <laughs> Yeah, this is supposed to be four dollars and eighty cents. It should be point two. I mean, I wanted it to be five dollars and a dollar, but I, it doesn't matter. It's still point two price ratio, no matter what. It's just the wrong numbers. My chart here says five and one. That should say five and one, but it's still a point two price ratio. I didn't notice that before. But. So, if you were here in uh, for the um, uh, 
Ag Professional Update, and I bet a few of you were. Dan Kaiser showed you some data from, he's making a current update to the MRTN database. And he's added data now for through 2020 and maybe even through 2021, but not all the sites. These are gonna be the changes that are gonna occur. Um, and it'll probably occur sometime later this month if it hasn't already, but I would guess it'll be a little later. So now if we go back to the 0.1 price ratio, if we leave the data for 1990, this is corn on corn, if we leave the data for 1996 through 2020, the MRTN is 172, the profitable end rate range is 157 to 188. If we take the data out from the 90s and just leave it at 2000 to 2020, then the MRTN goes up to 180 and the profitable range goes 165 to 198. And that just shows you that the last 10 to 15 years, we've seen this higher demand in corn on corn for higher end rates. And it, it goes along with the wetter cycles that we've had probably in the last 10 to 15 years. If you go over on the right, this is the corn after bean data. And interestingly enough, if you leave the 1990 through 2020 and the 2000 through 2020, really makes no changes. So this will probably, you'll see it go up from where it was before. The MRTN is gonna go up to 150 and the profitable range is gonna go somewhere between 133, 138 to 158, 159, something like that. But it really is not much difference in that data from the 90s if it's in there or not in there. But these are kind of gonna represent the changes we're gonna see for the next year. Now, that's at a point run price ratio. Is that what we're gonna be able to buy nitrogen for for the next cropping year? Probably not but it gives you an idea of where the database is moving to. Yes. Yeah, so the, the MRTN database, the data that's in there for all the states is spring applied in and counting or, or, or um, crediting your fall nitrogen in your DAP, AMS, MAP, and also anything that's in your starter in the springtime. Now we did a study several years ago, it's probably going on 20 years ago now, that said that we looked at the fall credit of N and DAP and MAP, it was applied in like early to mid-October. And we had a three-year trial. One year it was almost all gone by the next spring. The next year it was kind of about 50% there. And the third year it was about three fourths of it was there. So it's a toss up. It all depends, it's all driven by the fall weather and how early you put it out there as to whether it's gonna be around the next year. So whether you credit it, we are crediting in this database, but whether you credit it is up to you. The, anything that you apply in the spring, if it's AMS or starter credited, it'll, it's gonna be. And for the fall DAP or MAP, if you apply it real early, you say you're spreading this MAP and DAP right after the combine takes off the beans, then you may maybe credit half of it. It depends upon the weather. Good question though. So other factors for nitrogen, we had a lot of urea went out last fall. Um, a lot of it really late in South Central and Southwestern Minnesota. Some of it on frozen soil, some of it uh, in December when it was bare ground. We know that fall urea is not as good as fall ammonia, especially at Wasika in South Central Minnesota. Um, I'd be a little concerned about some of these fields. I know why people did it because there was at the retailer, it was in their bins and it was probably cheaper than what they could buy next year's nitrogen for but it's, it's not an ideal situation. Late fall broadcast, likely no incorporation, dry soils. We know that volatilization losses do not stop just because temperatures get cold. If it laid there on the surface and it didn't get incorporated and it didn't rain, urea can continue to volatilize even at temperatures in the 30s. Residual soil nitrate. I don't know if any of you, we've done the study, nitrogen studies that I've done that we've got the data back from the lab. I would say more than half of them have elevated nitrate in the soil profile after harvest. You guys were a lot drier here than we were at Wasika. The studies I was looking at were primarily in South Central and Southeastern Minnesota where they had more rainfall. If you haven't looked at residual soil nitrate in the fall, I would seriously consider taking a sample of PPNT in the spring. As soon as the ground thaws out, you can take it to two feet. There could be the potential to credit some nitrogen in that soil. If you've already applied nitrogen and you use the ammonia, you can probably sample in between the bands and just if you do it early and that you should probably only be measuring the nitrate that was carryover, but it gets a sticky point. I mean, if you did, if you did an application and you did tillage, then you've got nitrogen out there, you've got ammonium that hasn't been converted to nitrate, then you're probably better off waiting and taking a PSNT layer. 
So we got to get moving. I already burned through too much of my time. Phosphorus. So if you remember one thing from this talk, you need to remember this. You have to think that your phosphorus soil test is a probability function, and so is the potassium one. It's not a number. It's not a quantity. It's a probability of whether or not you're going to get a response to applying fertilizer. So if your soil test is very low, say Bray 0 to 5 or Olson 0 to 3, the probability that you're going to get a response if you apply fertilizer is very high, 87%. The expected yield without fertilizer is going to be lower, well less, considerably less than 100%. In this data base, it was averaged 87%. I'm going to show you results where it ranges anywhere from 60 to 95%. If your soil test is low, it's the same thing. Very high probability of getting a response and that yield response is going to be significant. It's going to pay for the fertilizer. So the point is, is if you're in this very low or low soil test categories, you must apply fertilizer phosphorus. It's going to give you return on investment. You need to do it. It's a no brainer. The, the moving point or the sticky point is when you get to the medium and high soil tests, because even at the medium where Bray is 11 to 15, now your probability of getting response drops to 27%. And your yield without fertilizer could be as high as 98% or average 98%. So it may not pay for itself if you apply. Now, if this is own land, I'd probably still apply. If it's rented land, then it's kind of a question mark. Once you get to the high and very high soil test levels, the probability gets very small. You're probably going to produce 99% of maximum yield without fertilizer. If this is rented ground, this is where you have the opportunity to save money by not applying, at least now when prices are high. And this is probably gonna hold true for the next growing season as well. So if you're older like me, you probably remember this guy over here on the right, Sam Kinison, he's a comedian, really popular in the 80s and early 90s. Anybody tell me what did Sam like to do when he would get his stand up? Scream, he screamed at his audience. So if this is my time to scream, Managing phosphorus in your soils is not the same as managing your checkbook. I get farmers that bring these data to me all the time, and I hate to bash people, but they've got very high soil test levels, and they've got their yield maps, and all I have to do is, okay, I'm going to put this amount of product on because I've got my yield map, and I multiply by a constant, and I'm going to put on exactly what I took off. Proper move. I'm going to do that religiously. Not when... MAP and DAP are seven or $800 a ton. That makes no economic sense whatsoever. And I'm gonna show you why. So this is a long-term phosphorus study that we did at all the research and outreach centers. And this is the summary after six or seven years at these sites. We got coarse textured soils in Becker. We got medium and fine textured soils at Lamberton, Waseca, Rochester. And then we had our calcareous sites at Crookston and Morris. This is a soil test change when applying P based on crop removal and part per million per year. So if you treated your soil like a checkbook and you put on exactly what you took off over that six or seven year period at Becker, Lamberton, Waseca, and Rochester, all those sites, the soil test increased with crop removal from where you started. And at Waseca and Rochester, it increased over two part per million per year by just applying crop removal. It, you just don't need that much. It's not a checkbook. Over here on the right is the amount of pounds minus crop removal you, you needed or the, the difference between crop removal and what was actually needed to maintain the soil test level at the level it was when we started. And that ranged anywhere from 17 pounds less than crop removal at Becker to 31 at Lamberton and 34 at Rochester. So the soil has its ability to provide some nutrients. It's not a checkbook. It doesn't just you don't go bankrupt if you don't put any on. Crop removal is fine when, so, when fertilizer prices are low, but it doesn't make any sense when fertilizer prices are very high. Take some out of the bank for a while. Now the caveat to that is if you got calcareous soils, now none of you are in Crookston, but at Morris, high pH soils, the soil test with crop removal actually went down slightly and it took more than crop removal to maintain it. So you need to think about a different management strategy and maybe banding is more effective on those calcareous soils and just regular broadcast amounts of modest amounts and not dumping a whole bunch out there every two, three years because it could potentially get tied up as calcium phosphates 
and you're actually, it may not be available to the crop itself. So the next thing you need to know is, is that you need to know what your critical values are. And that depends upon soils. Here at Becker, um, this is the critical or crop response and relative yield on the x-axis, Ray P on the y axis or I'm sorry, this is the y-axis, relative yield. X-axis is Ray P down here. At Becker on that irrigated sand, our, our, uh, oops. our critical value is 13.2 part per million. Once we got above that, there's some variability and there's some, uh, some uh, in, or uncertainty there. But once we got above that, there really was not a big response. At Wasika, it was 15 part per million. At Lamberton, we had a lot of variability at that site. Couldn't really fit a good model, but you can clearly see that there were plots that down here that had 20 part per million or less that had lower yields. Look at this Rochester site. You know, soil tests down to five, four, three part per million bray, and we're still producing anywhere from 97 to 90 or 100% maximum yield. There's very little response to phosphorus in that soil. Now, when you get here to the calcareous ones at Morris and Crookston, you see a huge window of uncertainty around very low soil test levels. And you're just not as confident as what that critical value needs to be. But at both of those sites, it was about nine or eight or nine part per million holes. For soybeans, that was for the last one was for corn. At Becker, we're looking at about 12 part per million, but we had more variability. Well, Seco is a pretty nice fit. Two years of data, 11.3 part per million, um, just a little bit lower than it is for corn. At Lamberton, we had a decent fit and better data, but it had a higher critical value. It was 19 part per million. Rochester, more of the same, really very minimal response. Not much yield penalty for not applying, even to very low soil test levels. And there you got Morris and Crookston. So usually the question I get then from growers is when they bring in their soil test maps and their, and their uh, uh, prescription application maps is, but I can't let my soil test break get lower than 20 because I'm gonna lose yield. It's just, I'm not gonna get the yield that I would get if I let the soil test levels go down. So in this same study, we looked at that. And the idea is, can we fertilize really low soil test sites with the appropriate amount? And can we get the same yield as if they were at high testing sites, even if they were fertilized or not fertilized? And other than an occasional odd weird year, like this one here at Wasika, where yields just seem to go up a little bit every time we fertilize until we got to the very high level, every one of these that's got a blue circle means that those yields on the fertilized low sites were just as good as the high sites and sometimes even maybe a little better. So you don't lose yield potential as long as you're fertilizing where you need to fertilize in those low testing soils. And the same we found at Lamberton. Again, Lamberton in 2015 had kind of some odd responses where it went up, but it wasn't significant or there was no significant interaction. But in generally 2017 beans, 2018, 2016 corn, um, where we fertilize the lows, we got the same yield as where we had high soil test levels with or without for phosphorus fertilizer. So this gets to that point where if you know you've got low and very low soil tests and you put the right amount of rate of fertilizer on, you're going to get the same yield. When you get the medium, you're kind of in that in-between area. When you get to high, very high, those are the sites where you don't have to fertilize and you can get the same yield and save money now when fertilizer prices are high. So the economic implications of this for current fertilizer phosphorus prices, it's kind of an own land versus rental land management. If you have own land, your soil test P is much more likely to be in the very high levels, greater than 20 part per million bray. Applying less or none has a minimal risk for yield loss and a large opportunity cost. You can spend those dollars somewhere else. Bray P is not a checkbook. You're not gonna go bankrupt if you don't apply exactly what you took off in your year. That's the one thing you got to take home with you. Rented ground soil test P is going to be more likely to be the responsive range. You need to know what your critical values are based on your soil types and what region of the country you farm in. Most of you guys are here in southwestern Minnesota, so kind of use the Lamberton and Waseca data. And then remember that the soil test is a probability function. It's not an amount of phosphorus that's in the soil. It's the probability of getting a response. Soybeans, I would say, generally respond a little bit less to phosphorus than corn, but I don't think management has to really be changed very much. 
and applying just for corn or in front of corn and then applying enough for the bean crop that's a purposely per perfectly fine practice. How about banded applications versus broadcast? I'll just touch on this briefly. Um, we did a long term, or we started a study a couple of years ago at Wasika. I have not, and it's also at Rochester. I have not seen much advantage to band deep banded phosphorus compared to broadcast in that study. How about starter? Dan Kaiser and I did this study a few years ago. Could we apply variable rates of phosphorus as starter across the landscape when we know we've got calcareous soils in some places, like right here and right here? And those calcareous soils have a lot lower Olsen P than the soils that are neutral in pH up on the knolls and in the lower areas. And typically people think, well, the lower areas where the high pH soils are and where the low soil test phosphorus, usually that's not the case. The lowest phosphorus is typically on the flatter ground that's in the lower part of the landscape, but it's flat and on these eroded back slopes. That's where you typically find the high pH soils with the lowest phosphorus. The lowest areas of the field where you get ponded water, they typically get phosphorus that runs from other parts and during erosion to those areas of the field. And occasionally they drowned out and you don't take any nutrients off the field. So the soil test there usually isn't as low as it is in other areas of the field. So the long and the short of this is, could we, could we variable rate starter across the field and, and, uh, and treat these low pH or high pH, low fertility areas differently? So the bars on the left here that are solid, those are the areas that got no broadcast phosphorus. The cross-hatched ones got broadcast phosphorus. And then we got four rates of starter. The yellow is no, the green is two and a half gallons of 10340 APP ammonium polyphosphate. The red is five gallons, the blue is seven and a half gallons. So we thought we could up the rate of starter with this no broadcast on a low soil test and that we would keep getting increase in yield and we could manage that low area just with starter, but it didn't work. We got a huge response to the starter from the control plot that got no fertilizer, but higher rates really did not give us increased yield in that low testing area. We needed to broadcast some fertilizer there and we actually got a yield increase to applying starter and broadcast in that low testing area. Now, when we went to the medium soil test, you can see that the control plot yielded way more than it did down here. That's that probability function. We still got a response to putting on some starter, but not to the higher rates. And the broadcast, eh, it was about the same as no broadcast with starter. And there's a couple of bars here that we did broadcast and starter that were greater. But in general, over average, there really was no advantage to adding starter to the broadcast once we got to the medium soil test. And when we got to the high soil test, there was a response to starter, but basically all the other bars at that point were the same, whether you broadcast or no. If you broadcast, you didn't need starter. If you did a little bit of rate of starter, then you didn't need the broadcast. And that makes sense in a high testing soil. So this, we had some interesting data from this, but it didn't turn out exactly as we hypothesized. So Molly, what am I doing for time? Am I do I need to wrap up or have I got five, 10 more minutes? I, I didn't remember when Tom started. Just keep going. All right. So now we'll turn to potassium. So this is a little messy and I'm gonna explain why. So we've got three sites, Wasika, Rochester and Becker. And this is the crop yield response to potassium fertilization across soil test potassium here on the X-axis. 0, 50, 100, 150, 200, 250 part per million ammonium acetate K. This is relative yield, 40, 60, 80, and 100%. So Wasika, the top ones are the unfertilized. Those are only the controls where the, the yield is only coming from the soil potassium that's in the soil, no fertilized. Down here at the bottom, it includes all the treatments that got fertilized. So we can fit a response curve function, and I'll show that in a moment. And we can also kind of see where the critical value is. So we get pretty close to 100% of maximum yield up here at Wasika and Rochester, when we get in that 125 part per million soil test in the controls, but Becker, it's much less. It's down here around 75 part per million. And this was one of the key findings in this study, that on those irrigated sands, our critical soil test level was a lot lower than we thought, and the rates that we needed were actually a lot less. But on the medium and fine textured soils at Wasika and Rochester, we actually shifted the recommendations the other way. 
we felt we needed more and we needed to have higher ranges so that we would fertilize up to a higher level. This is Wasika and Rochester um, with response fitted functions. And this is for soybeans in 2019. All the black circles on this, again, are the control plots where the crop is just responding to the soil, the amount of potassium that's in the soil based on the soil test. The red triangles are the ones where we actually fertilized. And this was a higher rate than this one here at Rochester. And you can see that response to fertilization. But if we fit a response function through there to find the critical value, if we want to set our critical value at 98% of maximum yield, we need 155 part per million at, at Wasika, and we needed 143 part per million on that silt loam soil at Rochester. And this is the reason why we shifted our, our levels up and we created the, the medium soil test level now for potassium goes from 100 to 150, and the high level goes from 151 to 200. And we feel that you need to be at least in that 150 to 160 part per million for corn after beans on these medium fine textured soils. What kind of rates and what kind of yield responses will we get at different soil test levels? Here we've got Wasika on the left, the glacial till soil, Rochester, the silt loam on the right. This is corn and 26 or soybeans in 2016. We got a low soil test about 70 part per million one that's right on the break between low and medium, right at 100, and then we got one in the medium at 120. What we see is that the yields responded to rates up to 180 parts per million of K2O per acre, and that's 300 pounds of potash. Um, and when we were at the low soil test, when we we're in the medium level, it responded up to about that between that 60 and 120 was ideal and no response after that. But when we we're in the medium level, started at 120, then we saw no response. Similar trends at Rochester, just a little bit higher soil test levels, and the magnitude of the yield response was a little bit smaller. That was for beans. This is for corn. See very large yield response here at Wasika. Soil test level down in around 90 part per million in the low category. We got 80 bushels of corn with just 60 pounds of potash. But yields continue to kind of creep up there as we went to 120 and 180. Once we got in that low medium category, got a big response to that first increment, and then it plateaus. Once we get to that medium category, yields trend up, but not statistically greater, and very similar results at the far right side at the Lamberton site on that plus soil. So the last thing we're going to talk about is band versus broadcast P and K, or this is K only. Um, this was a site at Wasika in 2021. The broadcast treatment over here on the left, 60 pounds of K2O broadcast, the soil test K is 84 part per million. So it'd be in that low category. See all these burn leaf edges? This corn, this picture was taken on July 8th. Corn was just about ready to tassel. In fact, you can see a stray tassel here and there. See how yellow these plants are and the burn leaf edges showing very distinct potassium deficiency. Over on the right, there's a couple of plants that have it. But when you got in there, there was very little potassium deficiency where the band application was on the right. And this was a deep band about five or six inches below the row. Now we had a little bit drier soil conditions and we didn't get probably as the yields that we wanted. This is from 2020. In 2020, we saw a numeric increase for band application at Wasika, but not a statistical increase. But where we put 120 pounds of K2 on per acre broadcast, we had a much higher soil test level and we had numerically greater yields than where we banned at a lower rate. But where we broadcast 60 pounds annually, those yields were similar to where we put the banded application, even though we had a low soil test level. So it hints that there's some efficiency in that band, but we're not statistically getting significantly higher yields. The question is, can we reduce rates? It's still too early to call that, even though our recommendation systems, those reduce rates with bands are in there. We're trying to validate that. At Rochester in 2020, we saw statistically greater yield with banded K compared to broadcast. It was six bushels better. And it yielded just as well as where we put 120 pounds of broadcast on annually at a much higher soil test level, a much higher ear leaf K content. And the yields were the same as the banded. So there was says that some suggestion there that at that Rochester site that there was efficiency in that band. And it produced high yields and nearly as high yields as a place where we put on a much higher rate and we 
at much higher soil test levels. <clears throat> Unfortunately, in 2021, we saw the opposite. The broadcast application actually yielded more than the band at Rochester. And again, we had lower yields at Waseca. It still has 200 bushels, but we didn't see any difference between band and broadcast. We're gonna do this one more year in corn in 2022, and then we're gonna turn it to beans and look at the residual effects. But right now the verdict is still out on whether the banded whether we can justify these reduced rates in bands and whether there's really an advantage in bands versus broadcast or K. Other factors affecting fertilizer return on investment for the next growing season and the one that just happened, we had drought reduced yields in a lot of places. Does that affect soil tests, phosphorus or potassium? <clears throat> I'm gonna have to quit pretty soon because my voice is gonna quit. <coughs> Reduce yields, reduce removal does not, is not gonna impact phosphorus. It might reduce potassium soil test, but that's because the dry conditions result in lower potassium soil test. <coughs> I'm done. <laughs> <coughs> One more point. <clears throat> so should fertilizer guidelines be adjusted? with high fertilizer prices? No, just the philosophy. You can save money on phosphorus by using a sufficiency approach to fertilizer instead of crop removal when you get these high prices. That's the final point. Thank you. And as Tom said, I'll be here for a while to answer questions. I might just have to whisper that. Yeah. <laughs> 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 <laughs>